disabilities. We will hear about business-led affirmative action programs, campaigns to, include, in, to increase disability awareness and accessibility, the employability of persons with disabilities, as well as partnerships and networks that companies can use to further improve their disability performance. This is a very important opportunity to share lessons as a means of ensuring that collectively we improve the inclusion of women and men with disabilities in decent work initiatives. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased that the ILO technical workshop that was held three weeks ago with national business and disability networks in Africa was much appreciated by the participants. These networks act as country level platforms for and by companies to promote peer to peer support and exchange. Moreover, they serve as a single voice for business on disability issues vis a vis the other world of work actors. It is my hope. It is my desire that by the time we organize the next ILO regional meeting for companies on disability issues, we will not only have doubled the number of such networks in Africa, we would also have achieved even more significant results. It is noteworthy that the ILO Global Business and Disability Network we launch a self-assessment tool for companies at a global annual conference, at its global annual conference. I encourage all present today to use this important tool. Not only does it support multinational enterprises with operations in Africa to, to assess their disability performance, it also enables African business and disability networks to fine tune their guidance to their company members. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, as I close, it's important to remember that the multiple crises, it's not just COVID, we have the situation with Russia and Ukraine, as well as several other crises that are confronting countries. These crises show that urgent and coordinated action is required to improve the labor market prospects for persons with disabilities. Kindly recall that the 2021 ILO Global Call to Action for a Human-Centered Recovery from COVID mentions specifically persons with disabilities as one of the groups that require particular attention. With full employment and decent work at the heart of inclusive, sustainable, and resilient recovery strategies, we must commit, I repeat, we must commit to a disability rights perspective and the meaningful involvement of representative organizations of persons with disabilities in all stages. I wish you fruitful deliberations and a very successful meeting. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Cynthia, for your very important remarks and reminders. Thank you very much. Uh, with this, we move to the um, chair, the current chair of the ILO Global Business and Disability Network, Accenture, represented by Ketiwen Kana, the responsible business lead in Accenture. And as apologies in advance for any names, surnames, family names, first names I might not pronounce correctly today. Uh, Ketiwe, floor is yours. No worries at all. Thank you so much, Jürgen. And um, thank you, Cynthia, for that really, really insightful and very thought-provoking um, um, introduction. 
as Accenture um, being this year's chair of the ILO Business and Disability Network, we're excited to welcome everyone to today's conference. We look forward to insightful exchanges and learnings from and learning from other companies um, throughout today's session. I also want to congratulate the ILO Global Business and Disability Network for this convening. One that is really critical and one as highlighted by Cynthia is a matter of urgency and I think requires us to really make sure that we do rally together as different sectors of industry, different sectors of government, external organizations, the development sector to make sure that we do accelerate disability inclusion. At Accenture, we are really proud of our inclusive um, culture and our inclusive environment. You know, we believe that each person has unique skills, talent, and strengths to contribute. Our ambition is to provide our clients with the best talent in the world, and there should be no barrier to overcoming, to uncovering talent due to disability, whether it is physical, mental, visible or invisible. We also know that disability inclusion, there is a business case to it. According to our Getting to Equal research that was published in 2019, when companies create an inclusive um, a culture, inclusive of people with disabilities, everyone benefits. Companies that embrace best practices for employing and supporting more people with disabilities in their workforce uh, have outperformed their peers. We adhere to strict non-discrimination, harassment, uh, meritocracy policy within Accenture and commit to providing a clear open line of communication between our people and management. We also focus on enabling of um, our people by educating our people. This is really critical and edu the education component is really critical when it comes to the point I spoke about earlier of stigma. By educating our people and making sure and enabling our people to be disability confident, we make sure that our people with disabilities can actually flourish within the organization without any stigma or any barriers and ensure that we enable them to actually succeed within their organizations. We are committed to providing reasonable accommodation to our people with disabilities through technology, workplace related adjustments, such as adapting a person's work, workspace and providing um, appropriate technologies where, this, where there is a need. How we actually do this is through a reasonable accommodation tool where anyone in Accenture can request reasonable accommodation. Again, I think this is an important point that speaks about the point of making sure that we enable each and every person within the organization. We have built very strong partnerships with organizations like the ILO and other business um, disability networks by collaborating with each other and with organizations outside the organization. And we believe we can help to advance the careers um, of people with disabilities, regardless of their um, um, economic situation where they are. We heard from Cynthia in terms of the immense challenges, the double burden that is often faced by people with disabilities. And we really truly believe that this narrative can only change by us actually convening to come up with very deliberate solutions and plans of action, you know, moving beyond just dialogue, but making sure that the resources that are shared, we do leverage them, whether it's private sector, the NGO partners, we really are looking forward to today's dialogue and looking forward to learning, engaging and learning from other peers. And thank you once again to the ILO for actually having Accenture to be part of the opening of this really critical dialogue. And thank you to you, Cynthia, and your team um, as the regional office um, in the African ILO office. Thanks so much, Ketiwe, and a thank you to Accenture for having shared or still sharing the Global Business and Disability Network for the next two months still and for the past 10 months. And next year, we will uh, have uh, Atos as the chair and currently the vice chair of the Global Business and Disability Network, represented by Neil Milliken. Neil, the floor is yours.
Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do an audio description of myself. I'm a middle-aged white male with pink glasses and a shortly cropped hair and beard. I'm wearing a, a, a sagonally um, stripy top. Um, and I have a typical English disregard for orthodontistry. So uh, more interested in uh, buying tech than um, buying braces. So um, with that aside, Atos is, is really genuinely committed to disability inclusion. It's my pleasure to be the vice chair uh, representing Atos this year and the, we will be chairing next year. Why is it important for us and why is it important for Atos in Africa? Well, we, we want skills as an information business that relies on people and knowledge. We require good skills. And uh, we recognize that we can find those skills in the disability community, or we can create them. Uh, and, and, and part of what we're doing is, is actually skills creation, because we know that to get business relevant skills, we have to partner and do some of that ourselves. So firstly, uh, I have a personal motivation for this because I've lived experience of my own disabilities um, and have benefited from accessible technology over the years. And secondly, you know, it's something that we've been building over the last 12 years that I've been within the organization. So what are we actually doing in, in Africa? Well, one of the things that we're, we're doing right now is, is setting up talent academies. And we've partnered with an organization called Zero One Talent to um, teach people how to code and teach people digital skills. And we set up a, um, an academy in Dakar uh, where we have 200 people that are acquiring new skills. Uh, and, and one of the things that we've done with Zero One Talent is to look at the accessibility of the learning platform. And we're co cooperating with them and supporting them to make this platform more and more accessible. It's already pretty accessible, but we continue to work on it to make it more accessible. And, and this is really like crucially important because if we want to walk the talk, we need to make sure that anybody can access the opportunity that is on offer to gain skills and therefore gain work. On top of this, we're hoping that we'll be able to announce firmly in the next few months uh, an accessible tech lab in, in Senegal. We're just planning this at the moment, uh, opening date to be confirmed. Uh, and we've been working on education uh, in collaboration with GIZ, which is a German Overseas Development Corporation, um, looking at how we can make sure that people with disabilities have access to learning and therefore being able to acquire the skills. Why, why are skills so important? Well, without the right technical skills, people with disabilities are excluded from the job market. Without accessibility skills, people with disabilities are excluded from the job market. So we need both sets of skills. We both need technical skills and we need the accessibility skills to address all of the challenges that organizations face with systems that have not been designed with disability inclusion in mind. Now, like all of the other ILO GBDM members, we've made commitments to providing workplace adjustments and accommodations for people. That said, the general IT environment, you know, software provided today by global companies is still on a journey towards accessibility. It's not fully accessible. So really cooperation and collaboration are key aspects to creating a place where people can work and can use assistive technology. So part of our mission is to work in collaboration with organizations like the ILO, with organizations like the, the uh, German Overseas Development Corporation, the Valuable 500, the W3C, to move society forwards to be more inclusive and accessible. This takes everybody's support. This is not one company competing against another company. This is an area where we can all collaborate. And I welcome the discussions today about how we can come together 
and all mutually benefit from creating job opportunities uh, that are disability inclusive in Africa and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Neil. And uh, on point, of course, on, on all the issues you, you, you mentioned. And well, you, you, you referred to a few things that we will discuss in detail more in this conference. Like at the end, you said partnering. Of course, we'll have a session on partnering. And we will hear from Neil more on the session on training. He already uh, said a few things about what Atos is doing on training. So, so that will be uh, another exciting um, intervention by Neil later today. So with this, um, we already move into the first a session, um, which is called Good Corporate Practices on Disability Inclusion in Africa. And before I hand over to the moderator of this session, um, Fatim Christiane Daye, she's a senior gender equality specialist um, of the ILO in that region, so a direct colleague of mine. I just want to highlight that in this session, um, those who have studied the program will have seen that uh, we have a few multinational enterprises represented there, but we also have smaller enterprises uh, represented there. And, and I want to highlight this because sometimes you might uh, hear um, that, you know, it's disability inclusion is something for, for bigger companies and they can afford it or whatever, you know, you might, might hear in this area, but it's clear, it's not something that depends on the size uh, and, and the scope or, or the industry of a company that uh, a company can work on the inclusion of persons with disabilities. It's really the commitment and will to make it happen. So I'm very happy that uh, we have a range of uh, different companies represented in the next session. So with this said, um, Fatim, I would ask you to take over. Uh, I assume um, you will also then speak in French because this is also a bilingual conference. So we'll um, hear more from you now. Over to you, Fatim. Good morning. The interpreters apologize. The speaker's sound is too poor for interpretation. Can the speaker please get closer to her microphone, please? Fatim, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we can hear, hardly hear you. Fatim, can you see if there's something up with your mic, closer to the mic? It's hard to hear you. So we then have an, also the problem with interpretation. Oh yeah, that looks better. Excusez-moi, est-ce que vous m'entendez? My apologies. Can Super. you hear me clearly yep. now? Yes, Thank we you. can. Thank you very much. I'm very sorry, says the speaker. So let me just come back to where I was. Regional director, members of the network, participants, dear colleagues, I was just saying that I'm absolutely delighted and it's an absolute honor for me to moderate this first session on good corporate practices on disability inclusion in Africa. As Jürgen said, my name is Fatima Christian India, and I am the Senior Gender Equality Specialist for French-speaking Africa, and I'm based in Dakar, working with the Decent Work team as well. This session seeks to highlight the best practices used by businesses, multinationals, but also small and medium enterprises in terms of disability inclusion in Africa, in particular focusing on those which contribute to disability inclusion within their workforce. Whether this is carried out through awareness raising campaigns on disability or recruitment processes which are accessible, training for employees, as we've heard from the previous speakers, or indeed participation in workshops dedicated to job seekers or persons with disabilities. With this, our speakers will share with us today interesting practices within their enterprises and initiatives which have been implemented to make their businesses more inclusive and accessible. So it is my great pleasure to introduce six speakers, seven speakers indeed, this morning for this first session. 
I would like to name these now, Madame Corinne Simon, who is a human resources counselor for diversity and inclusion at BNP Paribas. Mr. Amul Kouli, who is the human resources director for Accor Hotels. Mr. Luc Muleka is the founder and managing director of Science Media based in Kenya. Mrs. Rose Rinakuya, who is the human resources business partner and disability focal person from Uganda Brewers Limited based in Uganda. Mrs. Grace Nagumo, human resources business advisor from Kenya. Mrs. Marise Mackay, learning and development manager from L'Oreal based in South Africa. Before giving the floor to our first speaker, I would just like to just remind you of the uh, rules, if you like, for this morning. So if you have any questions arising from the presentations this morning, can you kindly put these in the chat box of the Zoom platform? Following the speaker's presentations, we will give some time to each speaker to respond to the questions that have been raised. Now I'd like to ask uh, participants and speakers, if you're not taking the, uh, the floor rather, please ensure that your microphones are muted to allow for the person taking the floor to speak without disruption. So without further ado, let me give the floor to Madame Corinne Simon, who is a human resources counselor in re international retail banking from BMP Paribas. Can you please uh, activate your microphone? Let's start with the first question. So we would be really delighted if we could learn about the initiative practices implemented by BNP Paribas, which have contributed to the recruitment of persons with disabilities, but also the way in which your enterprise contributes to the awareness raising of those with whom you collaborate towards the inclusion of disability. Law, Madame Simon. Good morning. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Madame Simon. Good morning to you all. Thank you very much for inviting me to this conference. It is a great pleasure for me to share with you the different initiatives that, that we carry out. In fact, I am responsible for inclusion and diversity in BNP Paribas and more specifically uh, on, uh, the, uh, on the Africa region. Uh, therefore, I have the international scope. So I would like to speak about the initiatives that are carried out in the countries in the Africa region. It has to be said that one of the priorities on our inclusion and diversity policy in BNP Paribas is inclusion of uh, collaborators, particularly people with disabilities and our countries are aligned with our policy and they are committed to ensuring that uh, actions are carried out to ensure that these collaborators are included and this includes collaborators of people people living with their disabilities so that they are treated fairly when it comes to their career progression so more concretely, what are the initiatives that we have uh, put in place to promote the inclusion of uh, people with disabilities? We have three pillars. First of all, we have communication. Communication that is both inside and outside the organization. What do I mean by that? I mean that uh, we as a company, we need to speak about these topics so that we can change people's points of view. 
whether this is society's point of view or whether this is a point of view that other employers that, that might have. So when we have uh, our um, members of staff at that can take the floor in different meetings and uh, conferences, they speak about their commitment, the actions that are being undertaken, but they also speak about what is happening with HR. So this is a way of raising awareness. This is a way of providing information, and that is a very important pillar. Uh, let me give you an example. For example, there are different events that are organized in different countries. And uh, to give you an example, we had uh, Talent Day 2022. So when we are talking about people with disabilities, we are talking about uh, including talent. So I think it's very important to understand uh, disability as a talent. And we speak about uh, inclusion, socio-professional inclusion at these kinds of events because it raises awareness to other companies so that they too include people with disabilities. And another issue regarding communication is our internal communication. And this was already mentioned previously. We have uh, two interlocutors, so we need to speak to the collaborators, the people we work with, and the managers. So it means that top management needs to sponsor our actions. They need to sponsor the actions that we are going to carry out to ensure that our inclusion policy of disability is really made a reality. We also need to convince them we also need uh, them to overcome their fears, the uh, stereotypes. Management might be worried that uh, people with disabilities won't be up to the task. So we need to communicate, communicate with the management and ensure that they too are committed to accepting people with disabilities in their teams. And of course, when we come to communication with uh, who we work with, then that is also important. So we need to speak about the issue and it needs to be made clear that people with disabilities can of course be included. The second pillar is recruitment. So this is the recruitment of people living with disabilities, but uh, also of interns. So this is where uh, we uh, in Africa work with local players who are both specialized in including talent with disabilities, but also people who are recognized uh, as uh, people living with disabilities who will work with the right uh, organizations. These people will take part in different fora and they will be the link between uh, people with disabilities, living with disabilities and companies. We have uh, in Algeria, for example, uh, the participation of uh, the employability fair and this is a way of showing that the local bank guarantees professional equality for all. And after participating in, the, in this fair, we had three people that were interviewed. One person was then employed within the IT department. In Morocco, we have also taken part in the Employment Disability Fair, which took part and took place in February 2022. And following this event, we took on uh, three interns 
having looked at 100 CVs. So what we see is that this provides a professional experience uh, for people. And this is also positive because it means that the bank can take on these new employees and they can look at how the company works. And this is what happened with Morocco. So we have uh, people who are working as interns, people living with disabilities who are doing these interns, and they are working within the HR department. We also have days that are dedicated to entrepreneurship and employment, and these are carried out in favor of people living with disabilities. And we will take part in these talent days to show that Yes, we are a company that includes people living with disabilities, and we need to ensure that people living with disabilities feel good. They need to be heard, and they need to be offered the conditions that are appropriate for them to be able to carry out their job, no matter what their disability is. And this is one way that we can be successful. We need to ensure that the conditions offered are those which make, for example, the building accessible. And then there are other conditions that need to be offered to specifically to the person in question. In line with this, we have a specialized department on training, awareness raising, for people living with disabilities, because what we often see is that people living with disabilities who are graduates are still reticent when it comes to applying for jobs. So often they will not even consider companies that would provide them with support. So in Côte d'Ivoire, for example, we speak to this center so that they can identify who our possible collaborators could be to tell them that we are um, available. So we can support collaborators, managers, and how do we do this? Well, we can support managers uh, with workshops, so managers uh, can express themselves. And this is an opportunity for us to tell them that it would be beneficial for them to include people living with disabilities, because uh, this increases the diversity but managers sometimes ask themselves, how are we going to be able to take on people living with disabilities? How am I going to communicate with them? Can I mention their, their disability or not? And that is when we need to reassure managers and we need to try and overcome any stereotypes that might exist. And that is also when we ensure communication with our collaborators uh, to tell them how we would be able to take on employees with disabilities. That is the second pillar. And third, we have education. That means that now we have programs that are open to young people that were unable to receive training and every year we have one or two programs that are specifically designed with an organization which allow young people to receive training and a certificate and this is what we have done in Algeria, where we have a specific uh, syllabus that was designed for people living with disabilities. I, Madame Simon, I, I apologize, but I will have to uh, ask you to wrap up. 
Okay, I will conclude. I just want to say that the best ambassadors to speak about and promote uh, inclusion of people with disabilities are our collaborators, the people who themselves are living with disabilities. And now, for example, in Algeria, we have a person who is living with a disability. They are following a career progression and through uh, the networks that we have is communicating to everybody else so they are their best ambassador i apologize for taking so long i apologize for having to cut you off but we have a number of speakers so we need uh, to be able to also have time for our q a now without further ado and thank you madame simon for your uh, good corporate practices uh, that are being carried out by bnp paribas now i would like to move on to the next speaker mr Coley, and i would ask uh, you to turn on your camera and your microphone Thank you, Kuli. As a human resources director at Aco Hotels in Côte d'Ivoire, could you tell us a little bit more about the way your group guarantees accessibility to um, the premises for collaborators of people living with it? disabilities so what are the initiatives that you have undertaken to recruit people with disabilities so i would really ask you to stick to the time so that all speakers can take part thank you very much thank you Hi, team. i will speak english I would like to all of you. At ACO, we have, uh, at my level, we have a and inclusion committee uh, that are in charge of all the aspects, uh, starting from the facilities, but also the spirit of accepting each other with all our differences. It's also uh, promoting uh, at world wide level. And it's in Africa where we're facing more and more challenge uh, due to our strength. And what we are trying to do in Africa is to be specific and very, very, very straight uh, to the point. For example, we will attempt to job dating uh, for person with disability. We will go there with our stand and explain them what is our industry, the hospitality industry, what kind of job you can find in a hotel how people will treat you in our hotel and how um, is our commitment to uh, disability and inclusion and to will to welcome a uh, person with handicap ACO and our owning company casada are very very committed to this so after that we will straight invite all those people with handicap who want it to come and visit our hotels because we don't want to communicate just to communicate. We want to show them that we have facilities that are really adapted to their situation. And most of that, the state of mind of our employees, because they are all sensitized on diversity and inclusion. So when the people with, um, the person with handicap come and spend the day in our hotel, they will see, they will test all our facilities and they will see how people are treating them because we learn from them that um, they, are, they are very scary about how people will treat them or how they are looking at them. So when we, when we did it, I mean, we were very happy because uh, all of them also was, they were super happy on how people were treating them and how they was at ease in our hotel. And from there, we even hired uh, as Corinne was saying, the best practices that we've done is that at HR department, we've hired one of them completely. We have many of them who spend uh, their training period with us 
some of them was hired and our best example is the one that we hired at HR level who is communicating and because he was saying that I need to share my experience to tell to people that it's possible and we can be happy. So we're very happy and proud seeing them enjoying themselves with us and being our ambassador. It's okay for me, Fatim, if I'm if I'm on time, I think. Fatim, you are on mute. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Kouli, pour cette. To Kuli for your examples of uh, good practices. And I would ask you to look at the Q&A. Uh, there aren't really any questions, but there are really positive comments uh, regarding the possibilities that you give to people with disabilities, not only in terms of access and accessibility, but also the spirit of uh, friendship that the ACO group creates uh, within its teams uh, and to the people that come and visit you. Now, without further ado, I will now give the floor to Ms. Mr. Luke Muleka. Mr. Luke Muleka, could you please turn your camera on? Thank you. Monsieur Luc Muleka, vous êtes Mr. Luc Muleka, you are founder and director general of Science Media, a Kenyan company that works as a social enterprise and contributes to the economic development, uh, social uh, development of the talent of people with disabilities. Could you please tell us a little bit about uh, your inclusive culture in the country, in the company, and in terms uh, of uh, the strategic plan, you said that you have 60% of people uh, with disabilities. So how does this work? Could you also tell us uh, how you use sign language developed by science media and how this has contributed to overcoming communication barriers between people who are hard of hearing and companies, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Luke, I now give the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for this opportunity, Fatima. And um, I want to say uh, that my name is Luke Muleka. I'm the founder and managing director of Science Media Kenya Limited, a company that propagates social, economic, political, and talent development of persons with disabilities uh, through um, assistive technologies. And um, this was found way back in 2011, but and started operating in uh, 2017 as a business. Science Media, um, uh, has three products. The first product is um, um, a sign language television station, uh, Science TV, which broadcasts in sign language with voiced overrides. And the second product is a sign language interpreter's mobile application uh, called Assistol that enables um, users and people who will want to access sign language interpretation. To do it the way you will access uh, Uber is found on um, Android uh, platform and you pay for interpretation as you go, just the way you'll pay Uber or any a taxi hailing company. So basically it's a uh, interpreter's hailing uh, mobile application. The, sec the third uh, product that we have is um, an outreach program called Uhai Festival. It is a festival that enables persons with disability to showcase their talent. And we bring uh, corporates together and state actors, um, uh, uh, NGOs and the general public just to see the talent that persons with disabilities have. And this basically um, uh, 
lies within our man, our objectives, uh, key objective, which is to propagate social, economic, political, and talent development of persons with disabilities. At Science TV, 80% of our, our programming is uh, hosted by persons with disabilities. And uh, this goes also within our framework as a company where uh, we have a, a progressive policy and it's a policy where we have activated from the day first day of the company that 60% of our employees should be persons with disabilities. So what we've done is we've put um, as a KPI or as a milestone for the HR team to know that one of the things the, the, the management is measuring on them is the delivery of 60% of employment. And anytime it is falls below that, it is uh, something that the HR knows that it is um, a KPI that they have folded, folded and it might affect the appraisal. So that is a progressive from the strategic point of view or the poly, policy point of view of the company whereby the HR is, is being measured based on this KPI or this measurement. So um, that is one thing that we've used to, to deliver. Um, during COVID-19 as a company, uh, we realized that there was um, uh, the issue of um, uh, deaf people you know, being in isolation and limited sign language interpretation uh, because um, uh, the interpreters will be using face masks, masks. So what we did is we came up with a solution uh, which is uh, uh, sign language interpreters mobile application to enable the deaf to access interpretation on the virtual space. What has this, what this has happened that um, when we went along and after COVID, we realized that this application is going to solve a big uh, uh, issue in the community, especially affecting uh, uh, deaf people in uh, terms of healthcare acquisition, uh, transactions in the bank, uh, being able to, uh, to go to school because at college level they will want us. Then we realized that the other, thing, the other thing that is happening was that at employers, the employers were not really, I mean, were having a difficulties employing deaf people simply because of uh, another requirement to probably employ a sign language interpreter. We've realized that Assistol, which is a sign language interpreter as a mobile application, will be able to help uh, employers to be able to, uh, to, to employ deaf people and use sign language or use the application only when it's needed, when it's required for purposes of interpretation. What has happened is that this is opening up situations whereby when we were during elections that were held in Kenya, a system was used by uh, the election management body to help the deaf people to, um, to want to get information, voter information about uh, the voting process that was there. And number two, it helped um, in um, help the deaf people to understand even how to go and vote. So what we are expecting is that interpreter, I mean, the, the corporates are going to adopt this, those who will, uh, who would want to engage um, uh, deaf people in employment so that it's never now hard to have a deaf person working because they don't just uh, look at, uh, I mean, want to communicate every now and then. They want to communicate when there is a meeting. They want to communicate because they are delivering on their jobs. The only time they will want this interp interpretation service is when there is communication involved. And I don't think that deaf people just go to work to talk the whole day. They go to work to work. So what we need to do is, is to enable them to only acquire sign language interpretation services when it's needed. And Assistol has enabled this. It is uh, 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 since uh, that time we are seeing corporates that are joining. We are in the, uh, in the process of um, registering around 10,000 users. And out of it, uh, we are already clocked more than 20,000 uh, um, hours of communication. So we find that the app is picking up slowly, but it is steady because people need to understand why, first of all, do we need to include uh, persons with disability in the space of um, uh, employment, which is a very important thing that we are discussing in together today. Let's Je pense que nous sommes en train de perdre Monsieur Muleka. We have lost Mr. Muleka. You've lost me. Uh, it's saying the host has stopped my video. Uh, he seems to have gone. Perhaps uh, so that we don't waste time. I would just like to remind I'm all here. participants that they can ask questions in the Q&A box, putting questions to our speakers. Mr. Muleka. Yes, I can hear Mr. you. Mr. Muleka. 
You have another two minutes. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, one of the things that, thank you, but the host is uh, stopping my video. So um, please let my video continue running. Uh, so uh, one of the things that I'm, um, uh, I was saying uh, as, I will, as I conclude is that uh, we were intentional as a company to hire sign language interpreters at the first stage of employment so that deaf people don't feel factored out of employment at any time. One of the things that I want to say that uh, uh, culture, disability culture is a very key component. What we do is we train the staff that we employ, the staff without disability. One of the things is they have to sign uh, what we call um, a disability mainstreaming uh, article in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the company that states that one, they will respect persons with disability. They will be able to work with them. And we've never had a session of indiscipline whereby staff without disability are disrespecting staff with disability. And the other thing is the staff to understand that they are supposed to help persons with disability to attain their optimum um, um, potential at work. And this involves, for example, the person who reads my news, my, my nine o'clock news, is a person with visual impairment. So what happens is there is a, a person who understands that the moment um, my this uh, news anchor comes into the office, he's supposed to help him transcribe the news from uh, 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 voice, I mean, from written into braille. And that is something that happens that everyone knows what they are supposed to have not had a situation whereby a person with disability is coming to say in the office, I'm being disrespected. I am because we've been able to build this culture and the culture starts with the top management which is personally myself, how do I interact and how do I integrate persons with disability into the other staff? How do I respect, how do I show them that they are welcomed at work, they are respected and all that stuff so that there's, I've never had preferential treatment whereby persons with disabilities are treated differently. Appraisals happen per quarter. I'm happy to report that in the quarter appraisal that ended in the month of September, Actual deaf people, uh, the first 100% per appraisal, uh, according to the KPI, the top performing uh, team of the staff are actual deaf people. Three of them, one with 100, another with 98, another with 96. So when this happens as part of um, a company culture, whereby human resource understands what to do, how to appraise, the team is being absorbed the new, without disability, they are known that actually persons with disabilities are, then what happens is we, when we are doing things like celebrating birthdays, annual, I mean, quarterly celebration of birthday, we include them in the celebration. Thank you very much. Bon, merci, Monsieur Muleka. Thank you very much, Mr. Muleka. In the chat box, there are two questions which are really interesting. In particular, the question regarding to payments for the use of the application. And the second question is to know whether when whether you will switch off the sign language interpretation or if you're really going to offer it rather to other countries the sign language interpretation uh thank you very much for that question number one is um the payment is uh, per minute uh calibrated but on the on the per second billing meaning that uh, when you talk for one minute uh, you pay 0 0.3 dollars but uh, when you're paying per second, I mean, let me say in 15 seconds, you'll pay equivalent to the seconds that you've, you've used on the app. That is number one. Number, three, number, number two, that even as we are speaking right now, um, um, I'm, I'm traveling around and we are trying to see uh, how the other organizations for persons with disabilities, especially around the deaf community, are willing to go and to collaborate with us. Because now, again, it comes to you. Remember that sign language is um, differentiated. Like Kenya sign language is not the same as um, uh, Nigerian sign language. But what we are looking is to, for in December, I would be Nigeria, talking to the team in Nigeria, the Sign Language Interpreter Association in Nigeria, to see how best do we integrate this solution to affect, um, I mean, to include deaf people in the employment and also for corporates to use it to offer and receive services across um, Africa. So uh, we, go, we, we are encouraging um, Sign Language Interpreters Association to come and work with us. We develop a model because what we are looking is 
Uh, we know that there are very many deaf people, but few sign language interpreters who are qualified. Using technology, we are able to serve a mass of deaf people and able to move forward. So I would like to encourage Sign Language Interpreters Association across Africa to reach out. Uh, probably um, the organizers will give out my email so that we are able to, they're able to reach out and we work and collaborate. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Luc. Il y a d'autres questions dans la boîte. Si vous pouviez y répondre, ce serait très... There are some other questions as well which have come up. I'd be very, uh, I'd certainly appreciate it if you might be able to reply to them a bit later on. Now let me introduce Miss Rosemary Nakuya without further ado. Madame Rosemary? Mrs. Rosemary Nakuya. Yes, there you uh, are. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. You are the key focal person on diversity and uh, disabilities with UBL, Uganda Brewer is Limited. We would be most interested in hearing about your disability day. Can you perhaps give us a bit more information about these initiatives? Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, um, everyone. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, like I've been introduced, my name is Rosemary uh, Nakuya. I work as the HR business partner at Uganda Breweries Limited, and I'm also the disability focal person um, at the same company. So Uganda Breweries is part of the Diageo uh, group of companies and um, inclusion and diversity is one of our key must do's. And um, we, we believe it's not just the right thing to do uh, for business. Like the first speaker said, it makes um, business sense to, there's no inclusion without people with disabilities. So our journey to disability inclusion uh, at Uganda Brewery started on December 3rd, 2019, when we joined the Uganda Business Disability Network um, as founder member. By then we were only eight companies and I'm happy to report that um, the network has since expanded um, to more companies. And on that same day, we also signed the proof of commitment to make 12.4% work. 12.4% uh, as per the last census are the people with disabilities um, in Uganda. So signing up to that proof of commitment with the help of Light for the World uh, cemented our commitment to providing opportunities for people with disabilities. On that same day, we also signed a memorandum of understanding with site savers um, as well as part of our disability inclusion journey. Then in February of 2020, we began the work. We first of all started by commissioning a site accessibility audit. Um, to assess our readiness to hire people with disabilities. And um, after that, uh, after the site accessibility audit, we did a disability readiness checklist. Again, with uh, Light for the World, uh, we were taken through a questionnaire that helped us understand where we were uh, in terms of our readiness to hire people with disabilities. And as a result of that, we had to come up with a disability inclusion policy, which was um, inculcated into our main HR policy manual. Uh, we also did um, um, disability inclusive awareness training for our people manager and disability hiring training for our HR team because they are at the forefront of hiring people with disabilities. Then, um, of course, because of COVID, we had to put those plans on hold, but uh, when the economy opened in March 2022, we uh, participated in um, the first um, career fair that was organized for people with disabilities, um, again, in the support of Light for the World, and during that career fair is when we introduced or spoke to potential graduates with disabilities about our work placement program. And in March of this year, early 2022, we launched the first ever work placement program for people with disabilities. So it's a one year program in which we give opportunities for people, with, um, graduates with disabilities to experience uh, work setting, give them hands on experience to prepare them for the world of work. So what have we done so far um, around disability inclusion? Um, the first one that I've spoken to is commissioning of a site accessibility audit. 
Uh, we partnered with Uganda National People with Disabilities that came to do a site accessibility audit on our site. And the report um, that we, we were given uh, uh, suggested that we are on a good trajectory and there are a few gaps that we need to close, which we plan to close um, this year. Uh, the other thing that we did is in preparation for, before we did the site accessibility audit, we um, partnered again with Light for the World to carry out uh, disability awareness trainings uh, for, for all our employees. And uh, we did a whole week um, around inclusion week uh, last year, uh, just focusing on disability awareness, uh, person first language, you know, helping our, our employees get ready for, for, for people with disabilities that we'll be bringing on board. And in March of this year, we uh, onboarded um, 10 people with disabilities as part of our first work placement program. And uh, we had six of them with physical impairments. We had two with hearing impairments. We had a little person. And also we had um, 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 uh, someone with um, a physical impairment um, as well. And the other thing that we did, um, because we did have people with hearing impairments, it meant that we had to also um, facilitate uh, sign language trainings for our employees, uh, which we did again in partnership with Light for the World. Uh, we did a whole month sign language training for our employees um, to enable them be able to communicate and also to also uh, create an inclusive workplace uh, for our interns uh, with hearing impairments. And as a result of all these efforts, um, just early this year, we were we won a Disability Inclusion Award as part of the HR Reveal um, Awards for efforts around disability inclusion. And we were also named Employer of the Year um, as part of the uh, Federation of Uganda Employers. And one of the key components was around our work um, on disability inclusion and uh, what we've done to promote uh, equal opportunities for people with disabilities. What do we plan to do um, in the years to come? One, we are um, launching a mentoring program uh, for people with disabilities because we noticed we cannot offer opportunities um, to all graduates with disabilities, but what we can offer is a, a bit of mentoring just to get them ready for work placement when the opportunities do come. So we've signed up 30 young graduates uh, to be part of this mentoring program and we've paired them with an, one of our employees just to offer them uh, with mentoring around building self-confidence, around uh, writing a CV, you know, getting ready for the world of work and also offering any um, support or professional advice. The other thing that we want to do uh, going forward is also launch the second cohort uh, because the first cohort has taught us uh, quite a number of issue, uh, things that we need to work on, uh, but also building on to the strength of the first cohort. We hope to launch the second cohort uh, when the first one ends in, in February of this year. Then the other thing that we want to do is to close the gaps um, for, for that were identified as part of the site accessibility audit. Uh, there are some infrastructure gaps that we need to close out on in terms of um, the width of our doors, the height of our lights, um, the height of our sanitizers, um, and also any other uh, smaller pieces that uh, we need to close out on. Then the other thing that we want to do is to extend uh, disability inclusion to our partners because uh, we have uh, a whole host of partners across our value chain. So we work with farmers, we work with uh, uh, contract distributors, we work with uh, manpower service providers, we work with catering companies, cleaning companies, all those are part of our value chain. So this year what we want to do is not just to leave the disability inclusion story within Uganda breweries, but also extend it to our partners um, across the, the value chain um, as well. And also the other thing is on um, making sure that we continue to provide an inclusive workplace um, that ensures that all our people are thrive. Um, so these are some of the pictures um, of the things that we've had in the top corner. Uh, that those are the people with disabilities that we onboarded in March of this year. In this other corner, you see the sign language classes that we were doing um, as in partnership with uh, Light for the World. Then the induction training, they have went through a three-day induction training um, as part of um, onboarding them and making them um, welcome and feeling at home and creating an inclusive 
uh, environment that ensures all our people thrive. And also in the corner there, we have one of the facilitators, the disability inclusion facilitators from Light for the World facilitating uh, disability awareness classes um, for our employees. Yeah, so that is what we've done so far. And um, yeah, we are still on the journey and we are really, really excited um, about being part of the Uganda Business Disability Network. And I would call upon all companies to just join the network and uh, provide opportunities for young graduates with disabilities because they do have the potential um, to perform similar to what other employees do. Thank you so much, uh, back to you. Merci beaucoup, Rosemary. Thank you so much, Rosemary. And well done, bravo, for all those excellent initiatives. Now I'd like to have a look at the Q&A box. So at the end of our session, we'll give each of you a few minutes to reply to some of the questions that might have arisen. Now I'd like to ask Mrs. Grace Nzomo to connect, please. Bonjour, Grace. Good morning, Grace. Thank you very much for joining us today. Now, your role is the Human Resources Business Advisor for Standard Chartered in Kenya. Your enterprise is committed to the inclusion of persons with disabilities. And not only are you a member of the GBDN, but you're also an active member of a number of different business uh, disability networks across Africa and particularly in Kenya. Can you please talk to us now about some of the initiatives taken by your business in Kenya to be more inclusive and accessible to persons with disabilities and explain to us a little more about how your employees are involved and how they contribute to an inclusive and fostering work environment for persons with disabilities. Thank you very much. You have the floor. Thank you so much. And hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever part of the world you are in. In Standard Chartered, our ambition is to build a culture of inclusion that will enable us to be the best place to work, the best place to bank, and contribute to creating prosperous communities. This include persons with disabilities. Disability is one of our strategic priority areas that is part of our global DNA strategy. Therefore, disability inclusion is embedded in our global code of conduct and our diversity and inclusion standard. Our goal is to be a disability confident organization with a focus on removing barriers and increasing accessibility. How are we practicing um, good, pro good corporate practices in engaging us to be part of a disability inclusive organization? First, for our persons with disabilities who are already staff in our organization, we do have ass assistive technologies, that is screen readers for, for our visually impaired um, staff and also voice enabled ATMs in case anyone with a disability who is who is hearing impaired is unable to transact. We also have ensured that our building is accessible by having ramps. We have voice enabled elevators. We have orthopedic chairs for physically impaired colleagues to enable them to be comfortable in their working spaces and to be able to be the best they can be. We also have flexible working hours for our staff with disabilities in case they want to work from home, they want to work um, at some time in the day so that they can schedule their appointments, their therapy, or they need to get medication. We do have that in place to ensure that we work around their schedules as well to ensure that they are also able to take care of their physical well being and mental well being while, while still contributing to their work. For the staff with disabilities, we involve and engage them in our employee resource groups, which help us to inform on best practices by giving them a chance to clearly articulate their day-to-day -day experience, which helps us now as we plan our activities in the bank, as we 
promote any products, you're able to understand how is it affecting this person with a disability, because everyone is unique and you need that holistic view in able to have the best um, product or the best platform to be used for all staff. We have also partnered with organizations with disabilities in Kenya, whereby we ask them to provide us with um, staff with disabilities who have graduated and we have created a database where we look at any job opportunity that we have in the organization. We look at our database and we ask ourselves, is anyone with a disability here qualified with the right skills to perform in that job? And we, when we do find them, we interview them. And through those initiatives, we have managed to increase our colleague base of of staff from um, from a certain percentage, we have increased it by 65%. It is not where we'd want to be because the government has included in the laws that we have to have 5% of staff with disabilities, but this is a step in the right way. And we have tried to have that database in place. We keep on improving on it. We collaborate with other organizations in order to provide us and refer to us persons with disabilities who are out there and they're looking for jobs and have the right skills in place. We also have in place a DNI Council, which is comprised of our XCOM, because when we have to have, when we want to have inclusions and many programs involving disabilities, we have to have the buy-in of the leaders. Therefore, by including our XCOM, we have in, we have ensured that we have their commitment in enabling us to be able to progress with our programs, where we ensure that staff with disabilities are hard, we were, we are able to increase their numbers, and we're able to ensure that they have a very proper working place environment to enable them to succeed and to excel in their roles. We have also, as, uh, as earlier mentioned, joined the Kenya Disability, Kenya Business and Disability Network, which is a forum that seeks to enhance and respect the participation of persons with disabilities in the workplace. And by becoming a signatory to their charter, we're able to be a champion for disability inclusion while also collaborating with other like-minded organizations. I also encourage other organizations in Kenya to join this network so that we can learn and grow together because no one knows everything. And by sharing the ideas we have, we're able to learn more and maybe learn, maybe something didn't work and we're able to see how it can work and be actualized internally. We also have an e-learning course for our staff that is, in, that is are based on unconscious bias because when you see a person with a disability based on your background, you have your own view of them. But with that e-learning, you're able to see any unconscious bias that you had before and you're able to see this person with a disability as a person first without really looking at their disability. You're looking at them as a person first and then other things will come in later when you view them as a whole person and view them for what they can do, not how they look like like we have also ensured that we create awareness amongst our employees on different disabilities by promoting celebration of the International Disability Awareness Day, where we have webinars and we discuss different disabilities to ensure that our staff are well informed on how to maybe live with someone with a disability because anyone can be affected and not that not just in their workplace but even at home so that everyone can know how to deal with a certain disability and to view them for who they are and support them accordingly. In our plans, we are planning to also offer sign language training for our staff in the future to enable us now be able to communicate with even customers out there who'd want to bank with us and maybe there's a communication barrier in between. Thank you very much. Please may we have the speaker's microphone activated. And my apologies. Thank you very much, Grace, and well done for all those initiatives that you have undertaken. Now I'd like to give the floor to Mrs. Marie's Mackey and ask her to activate her microphone, please and your camera. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Uh, 
Yes, we can hear you very clearly. Thank you. Uh, can you so see me? You those of you are that can? the learning and development manager for L'Oreal in South Africa. And your group has taken a number of different measures in order to welcome and recruit more persons with disabilities. Can you please share with us your path towards disability inclusion, and in particular in the way your company contributes to welcoming persons with disabilities through training with collaborators? Thank you very much. You have the floor, Maurice. Good morning, everybody. I am Maurice McKay. I'm the Learning and Development Manager as well as the diversity, equity and inclusion lead here at L'Oreal South Africa. I am one of 70 diversity, equity and inclusion leads across the L'Oreal network um, and a very proud um, task and project, project role. Um, I've got a presentation that I'm going to share with you. Before I do that, I have uh, lots of hair. I've got long curly black hair. I have red lipstick on. I've got thick eyebrows. Um, I would probably call myself uh, olive in complexion, and I've got a, a black choker necklace as well as a black blazer on. Okay. I'm going to share my screen um, just to help me talk through some of the points. So at L'Oreal, we, um, we have four pillars that are centered around diversity, equity, and inclusion, and namely gender, uh, gender equity as well as LGBTIQ+ disability, of course, and hence why I'm here today, then socioeconomic and multicultural origins, as well as um, age and generations. Uh, really, when it comes to disability for us, um, which is uh, our, second, our second key pillar, it's around accelerating uh, the inclusion of people with disabilities. And that is through creating safe spaces, be it um, in the physical context of our safe spaces, um, but also just ensuring emotional safe spaces, being able to hold space for people who are suffering from invisible disabilities. So really it's tailoring um, our environment to both physical as well, to invisible as well as, in, as visible disabilities. Um, and for us, it's about accelerating that inclusion, um, like I say, through the creation of space, safe spaces, through recruitment initiatives, um, and I'll take you through a couple of some of those initiatives that we've been able to do here in South Africa. Yeah. But really in short, uh, our objective overall is to meet the local and legal obligations of the L'Oreal standard of at least 2% as a minimum. Um, it's recruitment, so partnerships with specialist organizations to really increase and help us where this might not be our strength to really help us to increase, increase our recruitment opportunities for people with disabilities um, and participation of these dedicated information and recruitment forums. So ensuring that we do participate, that we do attend, and that we have representation in forums such as ILO. Disability awareness training. So we've got extensive training, um, which does help as well that I'm the learning and development manager. So it really is to ensure that we're partnering um, with the likes of uh, really, really influential speakers. Um, we've had Lisa Bradshaw recently, as well as Tobeka Luwane, um, really to ensure we are not only creating awareness for our teams that are inviting people with disability into the organization, but also for our employees with disability to have disability confidence. Um, and then inclusive manager training for all our leaders across the organization. This is a KPI across the group. And then uh, various e-learnings, we've got an extensive offering, which I think is the envy of many of many large FMCGs. Um, and of those specifically, we focus on disabilities as well as unconscious bias and microaggressions. Our specific initiatives, which we've just rolled out and that is the launch of our Digital Marketing Academy uh, for people with disability, and it is a pilot for us. So far, so good. Um, and with that, we partnered with a, a recruitment agency, Edge Enabled, who helped us identify candidates that we felt was of talent and really would fit into the organization and the culture that is L'Oreal. Um, and they joined us in March of this year. And, and so far, I really think it, it looks promising. And of the candidates, I definitely see us um, 
securing some, some uh, permanent headcount out of our, our new recruits. And then awareness initiatives such as Breaking the Silence, which was actually launched in the USA. We've taken it upon ourselves to extend it here in South Africa, really to ensure that our employees feel safe to engage in the dialogue around mental health and wellness um, and showing their capability despite the disability. And that for us is important to ensure that our teams feel empowered and that barriers are removed um, and the playing field leveled to as much as an extent as we have control of. Um, and that for us is, is, is important. And it really is leveraging opportunities and moments to bring this to life through training sessions and workshops and panel discussions with, um, with the likes of Bipolar Day, which took place in March. Um, now, Mental Health Awareness Month, really ensuring and, and partnering with our brand teams on causes that can really highlight this because that helps us also establish the reach, not only internally as an organization for our staff, but externally to um, our, third, our second consumer focus, our, our population focus, which is consumers. And then obviously International Day of Disability Awareness, which will be coming up in December, and ensuring that we leverage these initiatives and activate it for our teams to bring it closer to home for them. That's it from me, from L'Oreal. Thank you so much, everybody. Just to all the speakers, it's been amazing. Thank you for the inspiring sharing. Um, it really has been so wonderful to hear all that you're doing. Here we have the speakers. Thank you, muted for tonight. Thank you very much, Marie. And congratulations on all the initiatives that, that you have. And uh, these are very important uh, because, as you say, there are many disabilities that are invisible. So now I would like to move on to the q and I would like to pick a few of the questions that have been raised. And perhaps my colleagues can help me with this. So, there are a lot of questions. But there is one that has been raised several times, uh, and this is a question that I will put to all of you, and that uh, is uh, the extension of the networks and particularly extending these networks uh, in the field. So that is to extend these networks across the Africa region. So how do the speakers that have spoken about their experiences and initiatives, could they strengthen and broaden the networks? Perhaps now I will give the floor first to our last speaker. Marie, could you let us know how you would broaden the networks? Um, sure, I'm just trying to pick up this so many questions. Could you could you specify the question in particular that you I was going to start answering in the chat, but then can, maybe you can just start by D'accord. La question ce okay, serait so the question is to know how companies can broaden and grow the network on inclusion in Africa, and particularly how can this type of uh, network then actually you be used um, on the ground? Okay, I think I, I think I, 
I understand um, in part um, the question. So absolutely, I think by being part of networks such as this, as forums part of this, from a, an Africa perspective, that definitely extends our reach and brings us closer from an awareness perspective. But I look, you know, and I speak about the business that is that is L'Oreal or that is fast moving consumer goods to an extent. Um, it really is to leverage one. We have access to to consumers through our project, through, through our products, but also through our cause, our cause initiatives. We have so many brand causes. And I speak about one of those later on in, in the next session um, as an example, which is Maybelline Brave Together, which is around mental health. Um, particularly among, among the youth, um, but ultimately it's leveraging what we do have and what we are getting right um, on the ground um, to catapult and piggyback off of that as a base. I think that is one, one really um, great opportunity and low hanging fruit for us to extend our reach. Um, but ultimately when we talk about across Africa, I'll just circle back to my point around uh, engaging in forums such as this um, and not, you know, there's, there's things that we often look at, and this was a comment that came across as, as on one of our panel discussions internally at a group level, is that it's beautiful and it's great to look at our counterparts in our network, across our global network, and what they're doing and what they're getting right. The reality is, is that Africa is a very different context, right? So there's some similarities and there's some huge differences. Um, we need to be looking at our, our, our peers, other companies within the African context who are getting it right and, and leverage that. And, and we've hosted panel discussions here in, in L'Oreal of Africa, inviting people from other organizations to share with us because sometimes you need to see what the benchmark looks like um, in your local context to be able to know what's possible. Uh, it's definitely through partnerships, which we go on into the next session. That's honestly how I believe we can extend um, our footprint and our, our engagement um, within the African context and on the ground at a grassroots level. I hope I've answered the question correctly. I had I, I picked up bits and pieces of it. Uh, you are muted. I think it is a very interesting one, and that is the following. How do companies, how can companies cooperate with organizations, for example, the disabled people's organizations or people with disabilities themselves? And how can we contribute to um, designing the products and services that businesses have themselves? So perhaps I can put this question to Ms. Rosemary. So how can people with disabilities contribute to uh, producing and designing the products and services of businesses. Okay, um, th thank you so much. Um, so the way we went into disability inclusion was uh, through partnerships. Uh, because when we were starting out, we didn't know um, how to get started uh, or where to go um, for, for, for help because we did have the the, the ambition of becoming a, the most inclusive uh, workplace um, that ensures all our people thrive. So the way um, we've, we've, we've been able to get um, disability inclusion is um, through partnerships with Light for the World, uh, with Uganda National People with Disabilities, with Sight Savers. Um, that's, that's the way we will be able to, to get uh, people with disabilities at, at the forefront. Um, and of course, like I spoke to earlier, in terms of what we want to do uh, going forward, is not not just to limit it 
to our employees, but also to extend it to uh, our entire value chain uh, from farmers to uh, contract distributors to our agencies that we work with on our promotions and campaigns um, to the service providers we use for security, for cleaning, for catering. Um, so once we have everyone at the value chain, just being conscious around disability inclusion, uh, we will then start a movement that ensures that uh, people with disabilities are given opportunities um, that enable them improve their economic um, well-being. We cannot hear the moderator. Thank you very much for that answer. Here is another question, a question that I think is interesting that is on marketing, digital marketing. Who that might have been for me. I'm typing my answer up and I can give it a go. <laughs> it might Perhaps be easier to I answer. Could, uh, hand the floor over to Mr. Luke Moleka. And the question is, uh, how can you develop training on digital marketing? Yes, um, of course, uh, in the in this digital marketing has um, given a great uh, opportunity uh, to the inclusion of persons with disabilities, uh, because now through digital uh, marketing or digital platforms, you can create, uh, you can have voice, uh, you can have voice, uh, sign language, text, all combined together, uh, so that uh, you can include um, uh, persons with disabilities in any training you have. So what has happened is in this space, what you need to do um, when you are creating content, you need to make sure that the content, uh, you create a situation whereby in the same room, uh, a deaf person, a person with visual impairment, and a person without uh, audio and, uh, and, uh, and um, a visual disability can all uh, access the same material in the same format without one trying to ask the other. So what happens is, the digital space has given a great opportunity uh, for those people who are creating content. And we've used this before, for example, in our communication and uh, corporates have reached out to us uh, in Kenya, whereby we are able to con convert their, uh, their uh, advertisements into voice and sign language so that the whole uh, plethora of customers that they serve, including those with visual and hearing disability, can actually be able to understand and uh, get the same content that those without any of those disabilities are able to, to get. So uh, digital uh, platforms and digital space is a good opportunity. Uh, all the corporates that I call upon, and this is one of the things we also offering uh, as a vice chair of Kenya Business Disability Network, uh, we also are training and uh, enabling a peer yeah, share. Yeah. How do you uh, reach out to persons with disabilities and digital space is a very good opportunity. Have I answered the question? Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Perhaps I can ask Marise to add to what was being said by Mr. Muleka, because we know that L'Oréal has a digital marketing academy. Thank you so much, uh, Fatima. So yes, I, I did start typing and I responded to Celine um, separately. So we do have a digital marketing academy that we are it's a pilot, it's, it's, it's quite small and we're testing it to see the responsiveness and any challenges that we might undergo. So far, like I said, so good. So the reality is, is um, it's actually a placement of, of graduates um, 
through a hiring, through recruitment agency. With, so we've placed these graduates in the business in digital marketing roles. We have an extensive um, uh, profile of, of marketing within the organization and we support their development, so their 12 month development with an accredited offering through um, an institution of higher learning. So by the end of it, they should be qualified in, in digital marketing. Um, and the reality is, is that ultimately it's to with the intention to retain them. So they are undergoing that. They've just uh, kicked off their, their digital marketing courses um, and we'll finish that off with an accredited course. Merci beaucoup, Marise. Thank you, Marise. There are a number of questions that I can sum up that are on the need to strengthen inclusion through skills development. Perhaps I can ask uh, Madame Simon and Mr. Cooley to speak about uh, this very important topic. We will start with uh, Madame Simon. Right, yes. As from the moment that a, a collaborator becomes part of the business, then we have to support them throughout their career. So this means that that skills development is vital. Therefore, training needs to be available to uh, these people, to anybody, regardless of what their disability might be. And we need to ensure that they have the conditions to be able to take part in this training. And this is something that we do need to be careful with. But our collaborators are treated fairly and they're treated in the same way as anybody else and this is important because we do not want people to feel discriminated against we want them to feel supported and we also want them to feel supported in their training so that they can develop their skills so that they can maintain their level of employability because we know that now we are in a context where uh, the jobs are changing because of technology, and it means it is absolutely vital that we support our collaborators. And this means that people need to have access to training so that they are not isolated. So they need to be included in training. Thank you, Madam Simon. Mr. Cooley, could you answer this question as well? Yes. If you look at our company, we know we have diversity and inclusion for all our collaborators, but I would like to call on our governments in Africa to make it easier for people with disabilities to be included in Africa. And we need to ensure that disability is no longer a taboo. Um, I apologize for taking so long to turn on my microphone. Thank you, Mr. Cooley. I would like to perhaps give you each one minute to give us your final thought before we conclude this session. And I will now start with Ms. Grace. Okay. 
Can you hear me? You can hear me? Okay. We, we, yes. You can hear me? Okay. All yes. Right. I had a challenge with my microphone. Thank you very much. Um, I think my urge to be will be to all employers in our different organizations, be it small or big, let us be disability inclusive and actually very intentional in terms of looking for the persons with disabilities because some of them might not be easy to find. But when we partner with disability organizations, we are able to tap into their networks to enable us to learn more from them and include us in our companies accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. We cannot hear the moderator. Madam Rosemary, vous avez la parole. The floor to Ms. Rosemary for your concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, my remarks would be to one to uh, two is to encourage um, all companies to join the respective business development, uh, business and disability networks within their countries, but also not to wait for circumstances to be perfect. You need to start with what you have. Um, disability inclusion is not very expensive. You need to start with what you have. If you do a disability readiness checklist, uh, you will find that you have everything you need in place to start to hire people with disabilities. So, so just start, uh, don't wait for things to be, to be perfect. Just start with what you have and just go on improving as you go by. Thank you. Uh, merci. Thank you. Thank you, especially because you are right. You're completely right. We need to, to start step by step by improving things. Now I'll give the floor to Ms. Maurice for your concluding remarks. Thank you so much. Um, I think my, my concluding remarks is that we've got Thank you. I'm just turning my, my camera on. We've got a long way to go, but and and the the you know the messaging that we we try to send across to our teams, and I just like to reinforce that is that you know we take out one day or two days to to really reinforce and activate a campaign around disability awareness or training, but then we have 363 days or whatever remaining to do something about it. Um, and what we've come to learn through a lot of the training that we've done and to reinforce what what um, the very inspiring Rosemary just said is that sometimes we overthink things. We overthink to a point of not acting at all. And um, it really is um, all initiatives are met with the most grace um, and appreciation. So rather do something than absolutely nothing at all. Um, and that for me has been a big learning lesson. Merci infiniment. Thank you very much. Now I will give the floor to Ms. Simon. Could you give us your concluding remarks? Yes. Could you please turn on your camera? Yes. So in conclusion, I would say that the role of the business and the role of international organizations and networks is vital because those are what get things moving in terms of our point of view on disabilities. But the political context and we need to create the conditions to ensure that people are, can succeed. So we know that uh, it is through conviction that we can succeed. And uh, we know that this really is beneficial to all businesses. Thank you, Madam Simon. 
I will now give the floor to Mr. Muleka. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, this is a very uh, good discussion that we've uh, started, especially in the region of Africa. And uh, it is a matter of um, amplifying uh, inclusion through participation. Because I believe that an, an, an organization that is employing uh, persons with disabilities, it is actually actively uh, preparing for a customer with disability. Because what I know is um, when you start with what you have internally, then cascading through organization culture becomes very important. So I'll request that um, very many organizations are, uh, we reach out as uh, business disability networks to our various corporates, probably uh, through our uh, employer bodies uh, to, and also the business bodies in the countries, in our respective countries to include, to make them participate, to have them to share some of this information because uh, it is through um, actively participating in employment that we have customers who are we able to serve our differentiated products and services to our customers. Thank you. Merci infiniment, uh, Thank you Mr. very much, Mr. Muleka. And now I will give the floor to Mr. Cooley for his concluding remarks. Thank you very much, Mati. I would say that, uh, as I said earlier, we need to appeal to governmental organizations to say that we need to mainstream disability and we need to ensure that uh, businesses and NGOs uh, can ensure that uh, they reach communities that are further afield. Thank you very much, Mr. Kohli, for your conclusion. And we have now come to the end of this session. It was a great pleasure for me to moderate this session. We still have a large number of questions in the chat box and in the q a unfortunately we have not been able to answer them all and i would like to apologize for that but i am sure that the speakers will be able to answer them directly after this hour and a half of discussion we have spoken about including persons with disabilities in terms of the good corporate practices through training, through awareness raising, which is done either within businesses or to a wider audience or to managers. We have had excellent examples of good practices of inclusion through digital platforms, through our different networks. And we also had a discussion on being able to include people with disabilities in our businesses. So I would like to thank all the speakers and all our participants. And once again, I would like to thank my colleagues who asked me to moderate this session. Thank you to you all. Thank you very much, Fatim. And um, it's it's our pleasure to have you uh, having moderated this very insightful session. Uh, thanks so much also for, I mean, for the moderation, but also the wrap up, as you said, very many issues that were touched upon by the, by the, by the speaker. Thanks so much, Fatim. Always a pleasure to have you with us. And thanks so much, of course, again, also from my side, from our side uh, to the speakers for their insightful um, presentations, for sharing their views and insights. Uh, we will shortly move into the next session. Before that, I would like to um, uh, launch a poll uh, just, and I'll do this right away. 
So I hope on your screen, you will have um, uh, answer options regarding the type of entity you are representing here today. Um, so the question is, which type of entity do you represent? And there are several options, um, but you can only choose one. Uh, um, multinational enterprise. If you're, if you're from a company, but it's not so big, so we have the option national or small and medium-sized enterprise. Employers Federation is the third option you can choose. A government authority or a ministry is another option. A trade union, local or international. An organization of persons with disabilities. And then other non-governmental organizations, which are not OPDs, organizations of persons with disabilities. And then there's other um, as, as a category of um, entity that is not covered by the other options. So you will um, have a few more seconds to, um, to reply. And it will be interesting, hopefully, <laughs> to see what the setup of the conference participants is today, um, the composition of the participants, including the speakers, I, I'm not sure, but I think the <laughs> panelists can also uh, respond to this poll. We would, of course, and I already see this um, on the screen that I have in front of me, of course, I will share the results shortly, that uh, not surprisingly, we have mostly uh, companies in, in, the, in, in this conference and organizations of persons with disabilities or other non-governmental organizations. I'll count down now the last 10 seconds for everybody who wants um, still to vote. Five, four, three, two, one. I'm ending the poll now and I'm sharing re the results. I hope this is visible on the screen. Um, just also just um, reading the, out the results. 19% of those who responded at least represent multinational enterprises. Um, organizations of persons with disabilities are actually a little bit more even 21% and NGOs are 31%. So NGOs, OPDs, and then multinational enterprises, and then followed by smaller companies, 5%, government authorities, 5%. Um, employers federations, we have 3%, trade unions, 3%, and others, 13%. Um, somebody says here in the chat, my type of entity is not covered in the poll. I run a social enterprise and NGO. Hopefully, <laughs> you replied in other. Anyway, so that was um, just to get an uh, uh, understanding who are we talking to and um, today and who is uh, in, on board today. Now, um, moving into the next session before we then afterwards break for lunch, uh, which is a session on national business and disability networks. Um, many of the speakers uh, in, in the previous uh, session uh, already mentioned that they are members of national business and disability networks in Africa. It's a concept that works around the world and it's, it's getting more popular around the world, including in Africa. So it's, it's very exciting um, to, to have this session at our conference today. The session will be moderated by Sri Lakshmi Subramanyam, more or less got hopefully the name right. She's the lead consultant for the Ethiopia Business and Disability Network. So Sri Lakshmi herself is representing a national business and disability network in Africa. She's uh, quite under the weather today. So thanks so much Sri Lakshmi that you agreed to still moderate the session. Um, it's very much appreciated and just shows your exceptional commitment um, to, to this work. So over to you and um, I'm, I'm sure it's gonna be a very exciting session. Thank you. Thanks, Jürgen. Thanks so much for the kind words. I am a bit under the weather today, but uh, I hope our speakers and audience will be fine with that, with a little bit of uh, discomfort, if I may face so. But yes, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We really appreciate the time and effort you took to join us today. Uh, I'm Sri Lakshmi Subramanyam, a corporate social responsibility CSR consultant working in this sector for almost a decade. I currently lead the Ethiopian Business and Disability Network in Ethiopia. Today, we are here to brainstorm, to advocate, to educate, and to always push the envelope on the subject of disability inclusion in the private sector. I'm delighted to moderate the second session of the ILO GBDN Regional Conference. 
This session will aim at presenting and promoting the national business and disability networks, in short, NBDNs in Africa. These networks are employer-led forums gathering companies and other relevant stakeholders from the disability sector to learn and share peer-to-peer -to, -peer to contribute to the development of inclusive workforce culture and to foster the employment of persons with disabilities in the private sector. Following the presentation, following we will have a presentation of the key insights from the ILO GBDN technical workshop for NBDNs in Africa, which was held earlier this month on the 5th of October. Our speakers will share with us their respective experiences with national business disability networks in Africa. Whether as members of an NBDN or as an organization or entity providing support to such a network, our speakers will give us an overview of what is an NBDN, what their respective roles are, and the benefits of joining an NBDN. It is my pleasure to welcome our five speakers for the second session. Firstly, Ms. Heindela Varela, ILO consultant. Ms. Umbolanle, I hope I got the name right. Ms. Umbolanle Victor yes, Lanyan. <laughs> Thank you. Head of Sustainability at Access Bank and also the chairperson of the Nigeria Business and Disability Network. Next, we have Mr. Paul Kasimu, Chief Human Resource Officer at Safaricom, member of several national business disability networks in Africa, and chairperson of the Kenyan Business and Disability Network. Next, we have Mr. Henry Saba, Membership Officer and Disability Inclusion Focus Person at the Federation of Uganda Employers, also a coordinator entity and secretariat of the Ugandan Business and Disability Network. And lastly, Mr. Simon Brown, Global Technical Lead for Economic Empowerment at Sightsavers. Before I give the floor to Heindela Varela, some practical information and technical aspects regarding the running of the session. Following the presentations of all the speakers, we will then have a Q&A session for about 15 minutes. Questions to the speakers should be submitted via the Q&A box. I will be able to see the list of questions and read them to the speakers to address them. As for the speakers, I kindly ask you not to forget to mute yourself or turn off your microphone and your camera when you're not speaking. We now move on to our first presentation by Ms. Heindela. Ms. Heindela is an ILO consultant who supported the ILO GBDN with the organization of the technical workshop held earlier this month for national business disability networks in Africa, held three weeks ago, which gathered coordinating entities and secretaries of NBDNs, EMBOs, and international NGOs. Heindela, could you share with us the key insights or takeaways from this workshop? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sri Lakshmi. And let me switch now to French. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Good morning. Uh, My name is Heindela Varela, and I'm an ILO consultant on business and disability. I'd like to physically describe myself as a young uh, Black woman with uh, Black hair. I have uh, glasses on and I'm wearing a white shirt. I'm really delighted to be involved in this session with you and to share with you the key insights and takeaways from the workshop on the NBDNs, which held in Africa a few weeks ago on the 5th of October recently. The GBDN of ILO also held a technical workshop for the coordinators and entities who are coordinators for the NBDNs in Africa and for organizations which are trying to put in place national networks. The event took place online and we had over 30 representatives from different organizations, as well as employer organizations, as well as from international NGOs. The first part of the workshop try to address and give a state of play of what was happening at the moment. There were five MBDNs in Africa and South Africa, in Ethiopia, Kenya, Nigeria, and in Uganda. These national networks were present, represented by their uh, respective coordinators, which allowed them to identify best practices and to realize that these networks are in different stages of maturity once these, these were set up with uh, solid operational structures, whereas others are still being developed. These national networks also shared a common 
willingness and commitment to put in place platforms to have an inclusive corporate um, situation and to foster persons with disabilities, disabilities inclusion. Also to put in place a clear structure and a key explanation of the roles of people involved in these national networks in order to ensure their success and also to uh, comply with what is expected of them. The key role of the different organizations for the employer organizations and the NGOs and how these networks work. The international NGOs are sometimes associate members and where they develop partnerships with these networks in order to bring to bear their experience in terms of disability inclusion and to strengthen capacity building of persons with disabilities. However, these NGOs shouldn't manage these MBDNs because these must be managed by the organizations, the companies themselves. And employees, organizations often have coordinator roles in the national networks and shows the commitment of the, of the business community to foster inclusion and recruitment of persons with disabilities and allows them to uh, drive towards ensuring companies are more inclusive. These national networks allows their members to find out more about uh, in inclusion of persons with disabilities by putting in place different services and products such as information on disabilities and audits assessing the uh, accessibility of premises assessment and checklist tools as well as holding different events into alia the event also allowed us to hear more about the initiatives underway in order to roll out new networks especially in Senegal, using with working with a uh, local NGO. In Morocco, the General Confederation of Businesses also showed its interest to implement a network in their country as well. Moreover, Sight Savers and Light for the World NGOs, through their own programs, have contributed to developing new national networks across Africa. The second part of the workshop allowed for discussion of possible solutions to address the concerns which were raised by the national networks in order to ensure that they're more effective, sustainable, and to provide the services requested by their members. These concerns pertain to the financial sustainability, effective governance, and increasing the number of members and services available. Now, pertaining to financial sustainability, various solutions were discuss discussed to ensure long-term funding. Different financial models were also discussed and among those suggestions, one solution which, which really caught people's attention of the networks was to implement a annual fee. At the moment, the number of networks don't request fees. However, financial participation is perhaps required in order to ensure the daily running of the networks in order to improve and foster further services and products and to ensure the long-term viability of the network. Now, governance is absolutely critical as well for the good running of the management and running of national networks and also to ensure its uh, sustainability. Participants also look to the way in how they can increase the number of members uh, of the networks. Different suggestions were raised in particular, networking, organization, and holding different events. To close, the workshop allowed us to uh, foster good practices and exchanges between different NBDNs in Africa to motivate other organizations to put in place new networks and to discuss uh, different challenges and how to address these in order to strengthen capacity building and also to, to foster dialogue and communication between different networks, not least with the ILO. To close, the participants were also informed of two documents. First of all, the self-assessment tool, which has been developed by ILO, which presented at the Global Business Disability Network, which can be held in, in this November, as well as a document which looked at the guidelines and the principles to implement um, NBDNs. And this document will be updated next year and will also include more tips and advice on the and management of national networks. And this will also be illustrated with examples of good practice.
practice into ADA. And this document will be in Spanish. I'd just like to end there and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Heindela. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm afraid my French is not very good. In fact, I don't know French at all, except bonjour. <laughs> but, but I will ask um, someone else from the ILO team to wrap up on some of the things that you said, uh, maybe towards the end of the session. Uh, moving on, you know, next we have Ms. Uma Balandli, Victor Lanyan. Um, you work at the Access Bank and are the chairperson of the Nigeria Business and Disability Network. We would be very interested in learning more about this employer-led network, in particular, its history, structure, members and services offered. We would also appreciate the opportunity to hear more about your role as chairperson of this National Business Disability Network. So over to you, Ms. Umbulandli. Okay, thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Omobolani Victorania, and um, I am dark skinned and I am wearing a pair of glasses. Um, the color is a mix of plum and wine. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm very happy to, to participate. I don't know if my slides can be shared. Um, okay, so I can go on um, without the slides, so I don't take take our time. Um, so the Nigerian Business Disability Network um, is a network that um, that was established um, basically um, to support organizations um, in terms of their approach to disability inclusion. Um, we all agree that um, the facts around disability is um, very um, interesting. Um, I mean, to say that we have over a billion people um, with disabilities globally and the various types of disabilities that exist from um, vision to hearing to neurodiversity to to uh, mental health issues to physical health mobility learning and others um, I think it's something that we all need to pay attention to and employers of labor need to embrace um, disability inclusion I mean if we take um, data from the US as an example we see that um, people with disability and labor force participation is 19.6%. And out of that, we have 12% that are um, unemployed. Um, and for people without disability, the labor force is 66.4%, and we have about 6% um, of them unemployed. So it's really not balanced. Um, if you can help me go to the next slide, I think I've left here. Thank you. Okay, I mean, I can speak on without, um, if you're having issues um, sharing the slide, I will just speak on um, to, to, my, to my slides. Yeah. Um, so really, what is workplace um, disability inclusion? Um, we see it as a way of creating an inclusive workplace where people feel welcome and comfortable and where they are seen, valued and appreciated for what they bring to the table. So not in spite of their differences, but including their differences. Um, at the Nigerian Business Disability Network, this is important to us because we know that disability inclusion is a critical part of any business. It provides um, persons with disability the same opportunities to participate in society as others. And without disability inclusion, it means that the businesses are not doing all they can to support their current employees. And they're not putting in place what is necessary to support potential employees. So it is very critical to hiring process and organizations have to be proactive about disability inclusion in order to avoid losing out 
unqualified talent. And we also understand and appreciate the fact that organizations that have strong disability inclusion programs have better access to talent and better employee retention. Now we see quite a bit of benefits of having inclusive workplaces, which includes, um, like I mentioned, the access to talent, appeal to different learning styles, improved reputation, but more importantly, um, boosting product productivity and innovation, increased engagement and employee um, retention. And of course, on, the, on a lighter note, but also important, helps to avoid lawsuits and bad PR, especially in countries where there are regulations around disability inclusion. Um, the key obstacles um, we've seen um, over time to disability inclusion in workplace include attitudinal barriers, environmental barriers, institutional barriers, lack of knowledge, inaccurate concerns over cost and difficulty. But these challenges also can be overcome um, once there is, first of all, management commitment and buy-in, buy-in from board level to executive management, and that scales down to how it is embraced and, and um, implemented across the workplace to um, also removing recruitment barriers, promoting accessibility and creating safe, safe, safe places, hiring experts to work with, um, promoting diversity at all levels, communicating with employees. Um, I, I recall one of the earlier presentations spoke about training um, of employees, very important, and being transparent. Now, diving deep into the Nigerian Business Disability Network, who are we? We're a network of businesses that aim to create a workforce culture that is respectful and welcoming of persons with disability. We also are able to provide you know, a unique platform for business-to-business -business support and peer-to-peer -peer learning on issues around disability. We're based in Nigeria, and in Nigeria, we currently have over 30 million Nigerians that are persons with disability. And so um, we understand that employers are, can be able to tap into the potential of this person um, to also, again, increase business revenue growth and enhance their brand reputation. So the Nigerian Business Disability Network has adopted the ILO GBDN 10 principles of respect and promotion of rights, knowledge sharing, job retention, accessibility, confidentiality, attention to all types of disabilities, evaluation, non-discrimination, equality of treatment, and opportunities. Um, in terms of our membership, 70% are from the private sector, 20% are organizations of persons with disability, and 10% are development partners and international NGO. Um, suffice to say that SiteSavers um, incubated the Nigerian Business Disability Network, and they still provide um, technical support for us in this regard. Um, so our employer members, um, are diverse, um, range from diverse sectors, from the finance sector to telecoms to FMCG, um, service sector, and we have a few NGOs with us as well. Um, so we have multinationals and national companies that are operating in Nigeria who are at different levels of their journey, but they are committed to disability inclusion. They are committed to creating new leaders and helping persons with disability and NEST their full potential. Some of our members in terms of names, um, some of them are multinational brands that we may be familiar with. Um, aside, aside the Access Corporation, we have Airtel, British American Tobacco, Chevron, Guinness Mobile, Unilever, MTN, um, Standard Chartered, um, amongst a wide range of others. Now, um, NBDN, the Nigerian Business Disability Network, um, serves as a disability inclusion hub for employers. So we help by um, supporting public and private organizations to be disability inclusive, both in practice and policy in Nigeria. Um, we also create and lead a network of organizations that are committed to promoting 
the values of persons with disability, how, that, how they add to the business. Um, we serve as a knowledge and resource hub for disability inclusion um, in the workplace, um, in country. Um, we strengthen awareness about and drive compliance with the employment component in the Nigerian Disability Act. Um, we facilitate disability advisory services like disability audits, disability policies um, amongst our organization members. Um, we also, from time to time, provide um, um, insights into trends and analysis based on research that is being conducted on as need basis um, for continuous improvement um, for our members in terms of their disability inclusion performance. We enhance the employability of um, persons with disability via trainings, development, coaching, mentoring, and other efforts. We also showcase our organization members who are championing disability inclusion, um, the lessons and benefits they derive from retaining employees with disability. Um, and what has been the impact um, on our members who are employers of labor? Um, one is um, inclusive business culture, um, disability inclusive outreach and recruitment, disability inclusive talent acquisition and recruitment processes, flexible and reasonable accommodations, external and internal communication of disability inclusive policies and practices, um, accessible information and communication technology, accountability and self identification. Um, other benefits, um, of course, include the peer to peer learning um, through the webinars, the symposium, the conferences, um, working groups, um, committees um, that, that we already have in place. And there are also plans around having joint publications and working with certain toolkits that have been developed. Also, there is the expert support. So the technical advice that, that and the technical support that we get from organizations like Site Savers um, have been very value adding to us. Um, also expert support um, for persons with disability um, um, and support from persons with disabilities. So it's a, it's a two way, um, um, two pronged approach. Then also in terms of strategic um, positioning um, for our members um, as some of the other benefits. Then in terms of our success story, um, I've mentioned- uh, Sorry to interrupt you, uh, Ms. Omobalanle. Just a quick reminder of the time you have about, you know, one or two minutes left in your session. Just a yeah. reminder. Please. Yes, so I, have yeah. just, I have just two slides. So one minute oh, for each slide. Sure. Thank Great. you. Thank Great. You. Go on. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I mentioned earlier on that we received funding from site savers, but ownership fully resides with the private sector and no longer with the incubators. Um, we've increased our membership um, since um, inception by 100%. We have full commitment by board and um, other members through the provision of expertise and resources is a non-paying um, membership model that we currently operate. So organizations that are members and believe in the Nigerian Business Disability Network provide um, resources, um, including financial resources for running um, the Nigerian Business Disability Network. We've also been able to strengthen the capacity of our members towards developing inclusive workplaces. We officially joined the ILO Global Business and Disability Network in December of 2021. Um, we've also joined the Nigerian Partnership for Disability Inclusive Development in order to provide a more coordinated approach towards achieving disability inclusion in Nigeria. Um, currently finalizing our legal incorporation in accordance with the Nigerian law. Um, and of course, um, working on a finance modality to ensure um, sustainability post site savers initial funding. And to the last slide, what type of future are we working towards? One would be the future 
of, and the now actually, the now and the future of leveraging technology to drive disability inclusion and engagement, advocacy for disability inclusion on at all levels and stratas and levels, um, participation in global agenda to drive disability inclusion and diversity, and also very importantly, collaborative partnerships with other private sector organizations, regulators, and other stakeholders on inclusive programs in the workplace. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Omobalanle. I think that was a very insightful and very detailed presentation about what you're doing as a chairperson of the Nigerian Business Disability Network, um, how the Nigerian Business Disability Network is actually helping companies as a disability inclusion hub is highly commendable. All the points that you mentioned, I think um, our audience would definitely want to take a look at it. So we will share the presentations after um, you know today's session. And even what you spoke about, uh, the commitment uh, from the board uh, or the management teams of uh, organizations and how that's important to drive disability inclusion in any organization, I think that's a very important and a valid point. We will discuss more on that later during our Q&A session. So quickly moving on to our next speaker, Mr. Paul Kasimu. Um, you work at Safaricom, a leading telecom company in East Africa strongly supporting and strongly uh, committed to supporting the economic empowerment of persons with disabilities and improving their lives by improving their access to employment. And as part of its commitment to disability inclusion, Safaricom is actually an active member of the Kenyan Business and Disability Network. And its steering committee uh, is chaired by Mr. Kasimu. We would be very pleased, we welcome you today, and we would be very pleased to learn more about Safaricom's experience as a member of this National Business Disability Network and to also hear about the impact and benefits of this membership on your disability inclusion journey. So over to you, Mr. Kasim. No, thank you ever so much, uh, Sri Lakshmi, and uh, greetings from Nairobi. Uh, first, let me give you a context of Safaricom in terms of our belief, because as we speak to, today, good morning, everybody, good afternoon, it's more of also to say the organization believe and why we partner with the Kenya Business Disability Network. So at Safaricom, we believe in purpose, people before profit. And our purpose is to transform lives. We also believe that uh, diversity and inclusion is not a nice to have, but it is the right thing for business. It's a basic human right. It's the right thing to do. And we also believe in not leaving anyone behind. Now, a study by Accenture in the US say that uh, getting to, equal, it's called the getting to equal in 2018, the disability inclusion advantage. Companies with disability champions are twice likely to outperform their peers in terms of total share value. It's also in the study uh, improved inclusion is, uh, makes an organization to be more uh, than four times likely to outperform their peers in total share uh, return. So inclusion is good for business and the entire ecosystem in terms of the workplace, marketplace, and the community. So that will be our belief in terms of why we are active members of the Kenya Disability Business Disability Network. Now, being part of that global business and disability network, Safaricom is committed and is a pioneer of the Kenya Business Disability Network and believes in partnering with other like-minded organizations to drive the diversity inclusion agenda in Kenya. Now, we've had great support from the Global Business Disability Network, ILO, and partners, including actually Nigeria uh, Business Disability Network, we are less than a year, so about 10 months, and I'll share with you some of the achievements we have, uh, we've made to date. Now, our objective is to advance employment and social inclusion of persons with disability in Kenya. And in terms of our disability inclusion champions, we are looking for organizations that have the conviction 
and the commitment to ensure that we have matters inclusion at the forefront of business uh, strategy. Now, currently as at October, 2022, we have 15 corporate members in the Kenya Business Disability Network. We have six prospective members coming in and we have the six associate members. So we believe by the turn of the year, we should be around 20 active members, corporate members. Now, our belief is also the Kenya Business Disability Network is a platform for employers led by employers, where we have peer-to-peer -peer sharing of experiences. We look at the challenges that uh, face us, as well as opportunities and solutions in our journey to creating truly uh, diverse and inclusive work environments. Now, we've had uh, a lot of technical capability and confidence on disability inclusion. We have had communication and awareness that we have built to members joining in. And in terms of also framing the story in an impactful manner, the story around the why of inclusion the what of inclusion, what does it mean to have an inclusive work environment, and the how of ensuring that we really drive uh, disability inclusion culture in our workplace. Now, all the members have signed and adopted the disability inclusion roadmap, which is the ILO Global uh, Business Disability 10 principles. And with that, we have also prioritized actions. We've partnered with the other networks, as I said earlier on, and in our recent uh, AGM, we committed to four key areas. We said, number one, we needed to drive senior leadership and staff sensitization so that there is buy-in, but also knowledge of what it is to ensure we have disability inclusion in the workplace. Number two is to proactively recruit persons with disability. And this is where now we give opportunities to people with disability in our workplaces. The third action and commitment we did was self-assessment. And we are using a tool that will help us to really drive disability inclusion, as well as accessibility audits to ensure that our work environments are really set up to be more inclusive than ever before. And the fourth commitment we've done is to do a joint work plan where we can hold each other to account. And we believe that is a great one where we all work together in this journey. We have about, I want to share about four quick uh, achievements in the last 10 months. I think we've established a structure and ways of working with, as a key milestone. That was really important because it enabled us to then see how we are growing. We have an, an employer, Standard Chartered Bank, that committed to about $900,000 uh, uh, to drive inclusion in the workplace. We have Coca-Cola in Kenya that has come in to look at women with disabilities in retail employment and the deaf in their mainstream uh, workplace. East African Breweries, which is a Diageo company in East Africa, is driving people with disability mentorship and then inclusion in, pipe, in supply pipeline. And then for Safaricom, we've partnered with several others, including Sightsavers and Stepwise, to drive talent pipelining of people with disability. We have onboarded 52 persons with disability with digital skills for internships in Nairobi, in Kenya. And we've also committed to, we currently have 3% of our 6,000 employee workforce as people with disabilities. And our commitment is by 2025, we would want to see that number grow to 5%. My final piece is what we've also found as a political goodwill and driving this at a national level. We are seeing evidence, or we have evidence of changing mindsets, where we are seeing strong advocacy at the national level. We have, uh, for instance, uh, youth who, there's one youth who is visually impaired, who is an MP, member of parliament. We have a nominated uh, senator, an elected MP and a nominated MP who are all people living with disability. And we are seeing the role of leadership and culture as key in driving the inclusion agenda in, the, in the, our businesses. Partnerships and uh, uh, partnerships particularly are key to accelerate and scale up 
the inclusion uh, actions. And finally, Steve Jobs said this, great things in businesses are never done by one person. They are done by a team. Glad to be here and looking forward to our partnerships as we go forward. Thank you and back to you, Sirak Lakshmi. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kasimu. Thank you for that wonderful talk on what you're doing at Safaricom, but also from, um, you know, from the night, from the Kenyan Business Disability Network, what you're doing in terms of uh, working with other organizations, the work that you've done with um, Standard Charter Bank, Coca-Cola, East African breweries, and also at Safaricom, I think is really highly commendable, all of these initiatives with these companies. Um, that's exactly what we want the members of National Business Disability Networks to do when you join one of these networks. It has to be driven by the private sector. And it's amazing that you're leading this. Uh, really appreciate what you do. And also, I think the target that you've set uh, for Safaricom is um, really admirable from already you're at 3% of your workforce, which is quite a big number. And to want to get there to, to 5% by 2025 is really amazing. We really hope and wish you're successful in this. And uh, yeah, we'll discuss more on this later. So quickly moving on to our next presenter, Mr. Henry Saba uh, from the Federation of Ugandan Employers. Um, he's a membership officer and disability inclusion focus person at the Federation of Uganda Employers. Uh, based on FUE's experience as the coordinating organization of the Ugandan Business and Disability Network, um, could you share with us more about the role of employer and membership business organizations in supporting the national business and disability networks? So over to you, Mr. Henry. Um, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. I may not really show uh, my video uh, because I'm not in office. I've gone for work at some island, which is in, in Uganda. It's called Kalangala. Uh, I'm sure some, uh, some colleagues here know about it. So the network has not really started to look for uh, some good network outside the office setting. So I got it somewhere in a restaurant. So I'm not really sure my background because it is a restaurant. I couldn't have proper uh, connectivity in an office setting. Nonetheless, uh, allow me to, uh, okay, uh, let me just show you how I look. Uh, this is Henry. <laughs> Probably you'll bear with the background. <laughs> Great, good to see Let's the see. restaurant and your background and you're perfectly <laughs> audible, so please go on. And I'll also ask that you excuse me in case there's any noise in the background because I'm just sure. in a restaurant. Okay, uh, my, name is Henry, my name is Henry Saba. I'm the Disability Inclusion Folk Person at the Federation of Uganda Employers. Uh, briefly, uh, to talk to you about the Federation of Uganda Employers. Uh, the Federation of Uganda Employers is the representative body for employers in Uganda uh, since 1960 uh, on issues to do with the policy and advocacy implementations and legal and business support services. Our membership uh, uh, has about uh, 650 members from all the sectors of the economy. So basically that's what I can say about uh, the Federation of Uganda Employers. Now, because of time, let me straight away head into the gist of the discussion right now. the National Business and Disability Network. Uh, in this case, I'll be talking about ours in Uganda, which is the Uganda Business and Disability Network. Uh, the Uganda Business and Disability Network uh, has its uh, offices at Federation of Uganda Employers. So currently, the Federation of Uganda Employers <coughs> is the secretariat for the Uganda Business and Disability Network. And therefore, Impliedly, this means that uh, what the UBDN does, or what FUE, the Federation of Ghanaian Employers, does, in essence, uh, is being done by the UBDN because uh, FUE is the supplier of the UBDN. So uh, the role of FUE uh, can't be talked about without talking about the role of the UBDN in uh, disability inclusion fraternity. 
So I'll be using those two interchangeably, but more or less I'll be meaning the same. They have both played, uh, they have both uh, played the same roles uh, towards disability inclusion. Uh, FUE, for, for starters, just like I've told you, it is currently uh, working as the secretariat for the Uganda Business and Disability Network. And uh, it has been involved in uh, developing strategic partnerships. Uh, as Federation of Ugandan Players, we've been able to have strategic, strategic partnerships uh, in terms of memorandum of understandings and th things uh, like that. We've also been involved in a disability inclusive policy development, uh, both uh, at uh, company levels as well as at the national level. Uh, normally, companies ask us to go and try to beef up their policies at the workplaces to ensure that they are more uh, disability inclusive. So that's why I say that at the company level, that's what we do. And we also do that at the national level by making inputs in any reforms and amendments in most of the, 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 the these laws that are up for amendments to ensure that the issue of disability inclusion is put at the forefront and also get involved in the, uh, in the act itself, uh, uh, the uh, PWD. We are also involved uh, strongly in organizing career fairs. Uh, our career fairs, uh, we partner uh, with the Light for the World. Uh, some colleagues from Light for the World are here. Uh, together with Light for the World, we've been able to play an influential role in helping, especially uh, young persons with disabilities, have access to employment uh, in form of you know, preparing them and also linking them to potential employers. Uh, we've also worked closely <clears throat> with the, some key employers. I'm glad that one of them is a panelist. Uh, I'd like to extend some special Thanks to Ms. Rose Mary Makuya from the Uganda Brothers uh, Limited. She has really played a very instrumental role in ensuring that some of the activities that UBDN uh, does uh, are really up to what we would want uh, to achieve uh, as, as UBDN. She has really played so well her part. We've also been involved as Federation of Ghana Employers, Stroke UBDN. We've been involved in delivering disability awareness trainings. Uh, now what happened is that first, we started off with the, us as Federation of Ghana Employers to ensure that our staff are more disability conscious. Uh, so we organized the training way back to ensure that the, the, the people we have at Federation of Ghana Employers are aware of what disability inclusion is all about. And from there, they took as for they, they selected me as the folk person for specialized training in disability inclusion uh, that was organized by uh, Light for the World, Site Savers, and ADD International. Uh, I saw a representative from Site Savers of, or, as well as uh, from Light for the World. I'd like to extend some special thanks to them to further equip me with enough skills to ensure that I'm in a better position to manage disability inclusion uh, issues as they come up. Uh, from that, we've been able to extend some of these uh, basic accessibility audits to our employers. We have a checklist uh, the, that basically uh, to, uh, covers the, those uh, basic accessibility issues that we ensure that as we audit uh, <coughs> these employers, then we're able to also look at uh, the area of accessibility. And it, just to add on to that point, we've been able to improve our occupational safety and health audit checklist to include issues of accessibility. Uh, personally, I also have a uh, bias in uh, occupational safety and health and at the Federation, among other roles, I'm the uh, occupational safety and health specialist at the Federation of Ghana Employers. However, for us to have a more inclusive checklist when we are auditing most of these, uh, most of our members to ensure that they're in line with the, the requirements of the Occupational Safety and Health Act in Uganda, we also did add the accessibility part to those audits. So uh, currently what's happening is that we do not only audit uh, focusing on uh, occupational safety and health alone, but we also ensure that the basic accessibility issues are part of the audit. So basically as we do the occupational safety and health audit, in essence, we are also doing the accessibility audit as well, covering a few basic things like the ramps, uh, folk persons, the policies themselves, uh, and things of, uh, of that sort. 
uh, we've uh, oh, since COVID started, we've been able to promote this habit inclusive response to COVID-19. As you all are aware, uh, persons with disabilities, we are more likely uh, to be laid off uh, or, you know, uh, yes, to be laid off because of the disruptions that COVID-19 caused. So we put out in papers, working closely with the ADDA, site savers, we strongly put out this in the mainstream media here in Uganda, that person with disability shouldn't be just laid off. There should be there should be engagements uh, to ensure that they can be treated in a way that would then suit uh, the working conditions. Because most people are working from home, and most employers have chose to lay off some workers and just remain with the most core uh, part of their workforce. However, we also expressed very well in the media, in the mainstream media that persons with disabilities should be also be, could be considered at the, as, as part of their core uh, workforce and things like that. So basically that's what if, uh, Federation of Ghana Employers stroke the Ghana Business and Disability Network has been up to. However, allow me to use my next few minutes to talk to uh, uh, the colleagues online on call here about- uh, uh, the Sorry, Mr. So Henry. Uh, mm. Sorry, sorry to to uh, interrupt you, but we're running short of time, and uh, you're up on your seven minutes. So, if you don't mind, uh, you know, can you quickly wrap up so that we can move to the next speaker? Yeah, sure. Uh, let me just use this minute to wrap up. Uh, our UBD yeah. uh, network was uh, started uh, in 2019 with eight funding members. One of them is on call. Uh, that is the Uganda Brewers Limited. Uh, but we also do have uh, companies that are known internationally, like Citibank. Uh, we have Sanat Chattered Bank. We have the other speaker from Sanat Chattered Bank. Uh, Coca-Cola. Yes, those are the ones that are known internationally, but we started with eight in 2019. But the network has since grown. Uh, and the, the, what we do with this network is that it has levels. Uh, for somebody to join, there's what we call level one, where they sign up uh, the UBDN charter, and then at this level, ask them to identify a folk person and all sorts of certain adverts that the person with disabilities is encouraged to apply. Then at level two, you basically avail them with a disability ordinance, level two checklist, help them to fill it in, and ask them to host at least one training with a disability, ask them to avail the HR for a training which they did not pay for, and hand at least one accessibility issue at the workplace. And lastly, at level three, we go through the disability ordinance level three checklist and form an action plan, adopt the other money and other policies for better disability inclusion, and have at least 90% trained in disability awareness, and have at least one five percent of staff from disabilities. So this is all I could talk to you about uh, the UBDN in the available time that was allocated to me. Uh, let me stay on call. If there are any questions uh, and concerns, I'll be able to respond to those answers. Thank you so much. Sure. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Henry. You will get some time to interact with the audience. And uh, you know, if you've missed out any points, you can share them during our Q&A session. Uh, thanks a lot for the great presentation and the role of uh, employer federations and how they can actually influence national business disability networks. I think that's really great. So quickly moving on to our next speaker, Mr. Simon Brown. Uh, he's the Global Technical Lead for Economic Empowerment at Site Savers. Uh, welcome, Mr. Uh, Simon. Your organization has been playing an important role, uh, especially in providing support with setting up and running of national business disability networks in Africa and developing partnerships to uh, you know, share your expertise in disability inclusion. In this regard, we would be interested uh, in learning more about the role of your organization and more generally, the role of international NGOs in supporting NBDNs. So over to you, Mr. Simon. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, to to me. Yeah, so I'll, I'll spend a few minutes talking a bit about our approach um, to, uh, to, to disability and inclusion in, in, uh, in the workplace, in particular with the private sector. Um, and I mean, it's quite clear uh, from and many of these companies have, have been talking this morning or being talked about uh, this morning that there are companies across Africa, both national and uh, transnational companies who are committed to more inclusive workplaces. Um, and these are the companies that we need to be bringing into these business and disability networks because they will lead the, the whole sector and, and drive change uh, across across the system. 
Um, and it's really great to work with some of these companies on the, on the screen and, and really brilliant to hear the voice of many of them on the, on the call. Um, our approach um, to working in this space is very much grounded in recognizing that we're working within a system. Now, that may seem a, 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 an obvious thing to say, but, but often um, uh, development organizations and disability organizations tend to get very frustrated with the labor market system and begin to, to replicate it or what I call ghost it, and that is completely unsus unsustainable. That, that we need to work within the system and strengthen the system, and that is very much our approach. And as um, uh, Madam Corrine said much earlier, um, that there, there are perhaps two major gaps in, within the system. But as we've heard from many companies, there is a lack of disability confidence and capability within, within employers. Um, and at the same time, um, there, there is a, a kind of balancing lack of self-confidence and employment readiness of, of, of people with disabilities. Yeah, now this is this is a reality across all of the markets that that we that we work in, um, and that we need to recognise that and strengthen the system um, as as a result of it. And the second part is that within those labour market systems, there is a lack of a of a capacity building function, a convening function, yeah, which influences the rest of the system to be more inclusive and builds the, the capabilities of the system itself. And this is where I'll come back to a bit later on around this very specific role of the business and disability networks and build on some of the presentations that have come through already. Now, the way that we work in this space is, 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 is looking at, those, at, at that kind of capability building of employers um, and recognizing that employers are in different places on what I would call the pathway towards disability confidence. Some of them are very early stage, some of them have, like Safari Com, are, are a much later stage and, and, and need different kinds of, of, of interventions and, and capability building. But generally, yeah, companies go through these three stages of engagement, yeah, of being interested around disability, and here a very important kind of um, direction pointing or, or, or signposting towards um, resources which will help them, but also signposting towards the national business and disability networks where they exist. Often companies will then move into that kind of equip stage of really wanting to have that, that timely training of, of managers and executives and, and general staff, but also guidance and accompaniment on how to remove those barriers that, that stop them being more inclusive, whether that be in terms of physical accessibility to their buildings or the effectiveness and the inclusivity of their recruitment policy. Yeah, so, so, so it's, it's very much a kind of equipping stage. And then finally, once companies are much more confident around that disability, is then the delivery stage, yeah, of then attracting uh, relevant employment ready candidates towards those opportunities in those companies. Yeah, so it's a, a very much a kind of a journey towards, uh, uh, towards uh, that, that, that inclusion in the workplace. And, and at the same time, then working with often. Yeah, of recognizing that that self-confidence and that employment readiness is something which can be addressed and relatively easy, re relatively straightforward. Yeah? So working then with systems like uh, the Accenture's online and classroom learning uh, exchange uh, as part of their, their Skills to Succeed program, but particularly when we link job seekers to mentors and address that self-confidence that, that, that people with disabilities often are, are struggling with. Yeah, and sometimes, and, and 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 one of our brilliant partnerships with with Safaricom um, around uh, technical skills. Yeah, really hard to 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 to, to achieve uh, or access technical skills like very deep IT skills. Um, but also, I would really encourage us to really think beyond the cause of company. Um, and uh, we heard this a little bit earlier again from Paul around some of the work that we're doing with. Uh, Diageo or East Africa Breweries Limited, particularly around farmers with disabilities and how they link into, into the supply chain of, 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 the, of the company. Yeah, and taking them be, the, the, the inclusion beyond urban spaces and, and relatively limited opportunities within the core of the businesses and into a much broader rural, um, perhaps differently educated population and where we can generate multiples more 
of, of employment opportunities. And the same with, with Coca-Cola Beverages Africa, again, in, at least in Kenya, um, of looking at that retail space, and particularly then women with disabilities as uh, small business owners and retailers of, of uh, Coca-Cola products. Yep, so, so value chains are a really very important process. But then coming back again to the what I call the riddle of the missing middle, yeah, that we've got to take these national business and disability levels very, very seriously um, and recognize that they are employer-led spaces, as uh, Omar Kalanli uh, very brilliantly explains. Employer-led, um, employer government, inclusive of people with disabilities as subject matter experts um, through organizations for persons with disabilities or organizations like like uh, like Pipe Space. Um, and really try to leverage those pioneering companies in whatever context we're working in to, be, to, to join and form these networks because these will drive change across those markets. Um, and just uh, a kind of call out if anybody is on uh, online that, that perhaps wants to, to, to join in that program in countries like Cote d'Ivoire or Ghana, Kenya or Malawi or Mozambique. Um, uh, or Nigeria, Senegal, Tanzania, Uganda, Zambia, or Zimbabwe, then we either have networks already established, yeah. or we will be establishing those business and disability networks um, in the coming months and and, uh, and and a couple of years. Yep. So if you want to reach out and, and find anything out, then then do email me. The email is on the screen there, sbrown at sightsavers.org. And uh, I'll hand back to, to you, um, Shulakini. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I hope you can see my video. Yeah, thank you so much for joining in today. Um, you know, what you're doing with companies and forming that important bridge, I think, uh, between, you know, the private sector and persons with disabilities. I think it's a great initiative. Uh, we can discuss more on that. I, I reach out to the audience to reach out to Mr. Brown if you have any questions. Um, quickly wrapping up our session today, we're, we're short of time, but also uh, other than one question, we don't have any questions for the Q&A session. There is one question on EBDN uh, from Mr. Teshome. I will reply to you uh, via message. So just quickly wrap, wrapping up our session, uh, I thank the audience and the speakers for your valuable inputs and stimulating discussion today. Uh, before I give the floor back to Jorgen, I would like to request the multinational companies attending today who have a presence in Ethiopia to join our Ethiopian Business and Disability Network. Uh, it has over 60 companies currently, and I welcome you to help us grow bigger and better. I will share my email uh, in the chat box for those who would like to get in touch. Thanks again. And I now quickly give the floor back to Jorgen. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sri Lakshmi, for the moderation and also, of course, encouraging companies to join the network in Ethiopia. And a reminder that all the networks we work with in Africa, but also in other parts of the world, are listed on the website of the Global Business and Disability Network, business and disability, all in one word, dot org, under members. Um, so now we will break for uh, lunch, uh, at least here in Geneva, and hopefully for, for most of you, this is around lunchtime, depending on which time zone you're located in. I envy Henry from, uh, from Uganda a bit, working from a restaurant in, on, a, on a subtropical island, so <laughs> hopefully you get some nice food there too. Um, we'll definitely go for lunch now. Since it's a long break, 90 minutes, uh, we want to keep you, of course, on board. Um, we, I mean, the, the, the conference will be open, so you can stay or reconnect afterwards. But maybe as a cliffhanger and increase the chances of, of having you still with us after the break, we will launch a poll now, um, and the results will only be shared after the lunch break. So hopefully the poll is exciting enough for you to <laughs> reconnect uh, in addition to the many, very many interesting dis discussions we have after the break too. So the, the poll will be open. With this, um, we pause for now. We'll reconnect in 90 minutes from now. In Geneva, that means 2 p.m. Um, I hope that's more or less uh, uh, the same time zone you're in. So uh, talk to you very soon in 90 minutes. And thanks for responding to the poll. The results will be shared then um, afterwards. Thank you.
So welcome back to the conference. Uh, I hope you had a good break and I uh, hope <laughs> the number of participants is not only because somebody uh, forgot to switch off their computer and I hope many are actually still listening and engaging. And I hope many will also reconnect in the next few minutes <clears throat> to be part of the following sessions. As we had a poll just before we broke for lunch, uh, I want to share the results with you now, uh, and then we will move into the next session. So the question we asked was, and hopefully it's coming up on the screen, in which initiative or initiatives is your entity involved? Um, and uh, we provided you five options, and it was a multiple choice option. Of course, you could be doing this and that. So. Um, 31% of uh, the participants that responded said they are a member of a national business and disability network. So that could be still uh, companies, but also NGOs. 15% uh, uh, said they are a member of the global... I'm sorry, I'm getting some uh, audio from... I to, sorry, I have to... Please, uh, please be reminded to only switch on your camera and your microphone when you are speaking. Um, or supposed to speak rather. Anyways, uh, coming back to the polls, the poll results. So 15% said they are a member of the ILO Global Business and Disability Network. That's great to see. Um, <clears throat> then 43% that said they are involved in, in initiatives programs related to the vocational training of persons with disabilities. And that's very, <laughs> uh, very um, well, that's obviously the topic that we will discuss in the session right away uh, in, in a few moments. Then another 46%, so uh, almost half of those who responded said uh, job matching for person, job matching services for persons with disabilities. And also 48% said development of tools and guidance on the employment of persons with disabilities. So those who responded to this, um, to this uh, question, to this poll, uh, do quite a bit, you know. That, that's really interesting to see. We had 54 people responding and you see like half of them uh, do something on vocational training, almost half of them on job matching, half of, of the response working on um, development of tools and guidance on the employment of first with disabilities. So th thanks for taking part in, in the poll. And now enough uh, from my side. Um, I'm very excited and happy to to give the floor to Losh Pater. She's a chairperson of the South African Employers for Disability, which is a national business and disability network uh, for South Africa, obviously. And um, she will uh, walk us through, guide us, moderate us through the session training persons with disabilities to enhance their employ employability. We have about 50 minutes for this session. Um, so over to you, Losh. Thank you, Jürgen, and good afternoon, colleagues. It is a privilege to be uh, moderating this third session where we will gain some practical strategies on training persons with disabilities to enhance their employability. I am an Indian female with shoulder length hair and brown eyes, and I'm wearing uh, glasses today. So this session, will highlight the good practices from companies that have implemented and supported learning initiatives, as well as traineeship programs aimed at empowering persons with disabilities with the skills required to enter the world of work. We are aware that sometimes there is a mismatch between persons with disabilities and their, and their skills levels. levels as well as those required to join a company and to really enter the competitive labor market. Our speakers today will share with us how their companies took the initiative to close the gap and train persons with disabilities with relevant skills uh, to enhance their employability. So it is really my pleasure to welcome our four speakers to the second session. Um, we have Waura Ba, Internal Communication Manager, Manager. And, and Miriam, Miriam Kane, Kane Human, Human Resources, Resources Manager, Manager at Total Energies, Mauritania. 
my apologies if I have any uh, mispronounced any of the names. Um, we also have Ms. Patricia Matlow, uh, Inclusion and Diversity Associate Manager at Accenture South Africa. And I'm very proud to say that they are also members of our organization, the SAE4D. We have Neil Milliken that um, earlier addressed us as well. He will be addressing us during the session. He is Global Head of Accessibility at ATOS. So before I give the floor over to Wara and to Miriam, I just want to quickly remind uh, our speakers of some practical uh, info and technical aspects. Following each of your presentations, we will then um, have an opportunity to uh, look at the Q&A box and I will read out some of the uh, questions that you can address or if it's uh, intended at anyone in specific, I will do, uh, direct that as well. And speakers, can I kindly remind you not to forget to mute yourself and turn off your microphone and your cameras when you're not speaking. Each of you will be allocated of about seven minutes. And I may also remind you at the end that you should wrap up due to time allocations. So uh, without any further ado, Wara and Miriam at Total Energies are Global Business Disability Network members, and they contribute to the inclusion of persons with disabilities through various initiatives in Africa. Um, Total Energies partnered with the local NGO to in fact train and recruit blind people. Um, Wara, you have participated in this training. Could you please share with us your journey at Total Energies? Thank you. Um, is Wara on the call? Oui, bonjour. Yes, good, good, afternoon. Afternoon. good afternoon. Can you please go ahead? Thank you. Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, um, Miriam, you, you're welcome to go ahead. And you can please turn on your camera when you're doing so. Um, is Wara not, not able to join us? Yes, it's Wuro. Wuro is here. My apologies. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm Mariam Kane. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Thank you. So, as you said, I'm uh, at Total Energies in Mauritania, and I was recruited 15 years ago, 2008, in the context of partnership that we have with the National Association of blind people in Mauritania. So in that context, she was recruited and had training uh, on software, which we set up so that she could uh, properly carry out, uh, do her job. So throughout the years, uh, she, she, we set her up according to her skills, and so she became responsible for, com for communication in our subsidiary in Mauritania, where she had started as a telephonist. So I'm going to give her the floor so she can explain her career path. Did you, did you hear what I said?
Yes, we're able to hear you. Thank you for that. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. We'll give you the floor, Uro. So uh, good afternoon, all of you. As Mariam said, I uh, um, uh, I am blind and I'm part of the young blind people of Mauritania and uh, the vice president of the blind peoples from North Africa. So I joined Total Energies in 2008. I was 20 years old at the time. And when I entered, it was at a time when I'd forgot, I had finished my studies. I couldn't finish my studies. So it's a time that I didn't believe in myself anymore. But Total Energies gave me this opportunity and, and I, became as a telephone operator. And then throughout the years, as Mariam said, I was able to uh, evolve further into being in charge of internal communication. And beyond the job, Total also enabled me to find my, my uh, my studies for this book so i and it's 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 this is a particular program to help people with disabilities in mauritania and help them have access to uh, jobs and total also enabled me to, to do a lot of training programs uh, which are connected to my work and which have enabled me today to do my job properly with the equipment that I need because, because people who are partially sighted need to have particular, acquire particular skills to do their job correctly. I'd also like to pay tribute to the initiative that you've started because you can't uh, talk enough about persons with disability. It's very important to include them in the world of work because there's a, it's still a very low percentage of persons with dis, disabilities who are working and you have to give them more opportunities and possibilities and give them more visibility so that they can express themselves. So Total's work indirectly uh, helped do other things. It gave hope to other people. They saw me working and many women from my association became more hopeful. So it's possible to work being partially sighted and here in Mauritania, I'm only, the only partially sighted person who has this type of uh, job. It gives a lot of hope to girls. And for the first time we had young girls who are blind who were able to, to train with us. And this is part of a movement which has given them hope. And they said to me, Total showed us the way to show that it is possible that if we study and make efforts, because obviously you have to make a, a, a really a lot of effort to, to study being partially sighted, but they showed us how they could continue to go to university and finish their studies. So me, it's also gave me confidence and this is why I accept my disability in part, it's thanks to this job. It's very important to giving, to give opportunities to people living with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you both very much for sharing your journey with us. Uh, we, really we really do appreciate, appreciate the time, time that you took to explain this, your journey. Um, I'm just going to uh, summarize for us. So we see how this organization was able to actually develop Wura to further uh, enhance her capabilities and to be able to take up the position uh, in a communication internal communications role and then was further able to also develop in the organization. And we also note the equipment and technologies and opportunity for further development given to her increased her access to work. So thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. 
and uh, thank you for your time. I'm going to now um, ask the next uh, speaker to come forward. Thank you. So our next speaker is Patricia Matlow from Accenture. They are a member of the Global yeah, Business you. Disability oh, Network. Um, and uh, in terms of commitment to improving the employability of persons with disabilities. Patricia, could you please share with us more about your disability cadet program and how this contributes to equipping persons with disabilities with the skills needed to work at Accenture and also share with us, please, how this enhances their employability. Thank you for that. Thank you so much, Losh. Appreciate the opportunity. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As Losh has already uh, introduced me, my name is Patricia. You're welcome to call me Patty. I'm an Inclusion and Diversity Associate Manager for Accenture South Africa. Uh, just a bit of description of myself. I'm wearing a black dress, green earrings with spectacles on. Uh, I'm going to share around our Accenture SA Disability uh, Employability Cadet Program. You know, this is a custom-made uh, program for Accenture. As Accenture, you know, we, we saw the need to have this kind of a program and it was designed to create meaningful career opportunities for people with disabilities and also to make sure that they obtain qualifications within the ICT sector. So the program focuses on candidates from previously disadvantaged background. And to, for them to qualify for this program, they need to meet the following criteria. One being the fact that they need to have disability and we are not restrictive in terms of what type of disability. We open to uh, both visible and non-visible disability. And secondly, needs to be young person youth uh, up to the age of 35. They need to have completed metric and at least have passed English and mathematics. So we moved away from the narrative that it is a challenge to find or to even recruit people with disabilities, especially in the technology space. And we created an opportunity to train them and increase their opportunities of being employed. So through this program, we actually created accessibility for skills opportunities. Uh, not only that we train them for ourselves, but we train them, I would say, for South Africa, you know, for any company that will want, you know, to employ them, you know, especially within uh, the ICT space, as I've said. Where have you started with this program? You know, it started in 2016, only with 10 learners, and it was a three-year program by then. But as we all know, that technology advances and it moves quickly. We saw the need to move uh, from a three-year program to a two-year program. So Accenture launched this program in partnership with our training college, um, KLM Empowered, to offer skills training and also to ensure that we create uh, those opportunities for employment around the ICT sector. And we realized at a very early age that we cannot do this alone as Accenture. Hence, we partnered with uh, uh, colleges like KLM Empowered. Uh, the cadets obtain a practical and a theoretical training in project management, which is uh, NPF level four. And then a uh, second year, they move on to do national certificate in information technology systems development, which is a NQF level five. So at the completion of this training, they would have a national uh, diploma. The qualification is equivalent to the national diploma. And to date, we've actually trained 77 cadets and we have a current cohort of 24. As I said, that uh, we ensure fair representation in terms of uh, ethnicity and gender. And we are trying to heed to the call for you know, ensuring that we, we put forward women in tech and create opportunities. And what's really exciting is that uh, we're doing this for people with disability. So why did we uh, engage in this program? Uh, disability inclusion is an obligation for us at Accenture, and we embrace it, you know, with open heart. And through this program, we are creating an accessible 
uh, inclusive opportunity for all, and especially for pe people with disability to thrive, you know, to belong and to feel that, you know, companies like us open their arms to create opportunities in a very competitive world of IT. The program serves as the best vehicle, you know, of attracting and retaining people with disabilities, you know, in the IT city sector. And what I really love about this is that it's one of the, I'll call it a flagship program where we don't just um, train them to just do temporary ad hoc work, but to ensure that they compete within the ICT space. It also creates meaningful career opportunities. And uh, for us, Accenture, you know, it gives us an opportunity to continually attract and retain people with uh, disability within the ICT sector. So as Accenture, we actually believe that, you know, our rich diversity makes us more successful. You know, I can even say it makes us smarter and competitive and it helps us better serve our clients and our community. You know, our focus is to make sure that we do uh, serve our clients well and we serve our communities well. And programs like this, you know, speaks to the need of the community where, you know, as most people know in South Africa, we've got a challenge with youth unemployment and uh, such programs, you know, will actually assist in making sure that, you know, we provide right. opportunities for our young ones who especially who have disability. So we have actually created opportunities to impact South Africa positively and the livelihood of individuals in that, you know, this program doesn't only focus at, like I said already that benefiting Accenture, but we, we were looking more in terms of benefiting uh, the, the, the country as a whole. Um, just to share a bit as well around, you know, the feedback that we receive from, you know, the, the beneficiaries, some are the current cohorts and some have already graduated. Uh, one said to, uh, to us that not only has Accenture provided me with an opportunity to play in the ICT space, but it has allowed me to take care of my own family. As it is now, I'm paying, uh, I've managed to, to, to rent a room for my mother, I'm paying school fees for my siblings, and I'm buying groceries for my own family. The other cadet said, I had never seen or touched a computer before. Joining Accenture Disability Cadet Program, but today, not only am I graduating, but I am a guest speaker in graduation ceremony, speaking on the fourth industrial revolution. Thank you, Accenture, for the opportunity. This is one of the people that graduated. Apologies, graduated. Patricia. Can you please yeah. use the last minute to just wrap up? Sure. Thank you. I'm, I'm actually, okay, yeah, yeah. So finally, uh, I just share this one. The final one was just somebody who said, didn't know what, uh, project management is, but today the person is employment in the telecom sector as a uh, project manager. Thank you, Lodge and everyone for this opportunity. The employability cadet program is very close to our hearts and it humbles me to see how we at Accenture South Africa continue to touch people's lives and to be competitive in the ICT sector. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for sharing that wonderful experience that you've had at Accenture. And we can see that really Accenture has identified the opportunity to start this cadet program. And it's very encouraging to see that you started with only 10 people in 2016. And then you also identified that you needed to partner with the right person. And then you identified KLM Empowered. And I really like the fact that this is uh, in line with, um, you know, technology and the fourth industrial revolution and, and beyond, and that the employees uh, has been given a pathway from uh, starting with the NQF level four and advancing to a national diploma at the NQF level five, and also that you you've taken candidates 
uh, from the community and considering the economic conditions in South Africa at the moment and unemployment uh, rates, you're actually addressing that. So you are looking to serve your clients and the community and you've taken a holistic approach uh, to address youth and uh, unemployment. And this also impacts positively on the livelihoods and lives of persons with disabilities. So excellent work and thank you so much for sharing those insights and your journey with us. Thank you so much. So I'm going to go ahead now and introduce to you our next speaker, which is Neil Mulliken. And he is also the vice chair of the GBDN. And last July, in partnership with Zero One Talent Africa, ATOS launched its first collective intelligence zone, providing digital training. Based in ATOS offices in Dakar, the center will welcome hundreds of young talent to develop digital skills. Um, Neil, could you please tell us how ATOS made this mainstream digital training inclusive as well as accessible to young talent with disabilities in order to equip them with skills to be part of the digital transformation, both globally and in the African continent as well? Thank you so much. Sure, thank you. And uh, I'm Neil. I'm a white middle-aged male wearing pink glasses. I've got cropped sandy hair and a short beard. Um, so yes, we've been working with uh, Zero One Talent as their, their main partner uh, in Africa, looking to um, build up digital skills. And, 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 and the program is open to anyone. It's free for people to apply. Um, and, and the real difference, I think, is that you don't need any qualifications at all to apply, but there are aptitude tests to enable people to um, show the capability to learn, because this is a peer learning program where people teach each other digital skills and, and they're immersed in a, a digital environment for the best part of uh, 18 months, acquiring relevant digital skills that we and other organizations need um, and we have done you know, accessibility work to support that to make sure that the the actual platform is 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 pretty good on on accessibility there's continuing work to make it better and also um, the actual assessment process so um, really often people with disabilities are excluded from formal education, uh, particularly so in, in Africa, but across the globe, um, due to lack of accessibility, lack of opportunity to, uh, to learn social and cultural attitudes. So by having a program that doesn't demand prior academic qualifications, we're reducing some of the barriers by also then making that program as accessible as we can, we're reducing more of the barriers and opening up opportunities. The aim over time is to, to train 25,000 people over a course of, of 10 years. Now, we're not going to employ all of them. That means that we'll be creating skills for other organizations and a talent pool of qualified people with disabilities across the piece. Not all of that 25,000 are going to be people with disabilities, but we hope to get a, a societally representative group. Um, and as part of the work that we're doing, building the zone to be accessible, we're putting in place assistive technologies so that the students can um, use them themselves and also familiarize themselves with the accessibility tools that are required to support people with disabilities have access to information. So, so what we're doing is a sort of two-pronged approach. So that's that's one significant area. Also, you know, I'd echo what my colleague from Accenture, Patsy, said about the, the, the effect of employment on the individual's families. 
Now, our, our CEO for Africa said that on average, when we employ someone um, for the first time, the impact of their salary is, has a positive impact on 10 other people. Um, and if you um, take that for someone with a disability, it's likely to be more because you're freeing up their carers um, from um, a care process and care responsibilities and making them able to work and earn as well. So the, the economic impact is really significant. On top of this, we, we have recognized that you know, access to education is, is really significant. And, and that was why we teamed up with um, GIZ, which is the German Overseas Development Corporation last year. And we launched a program called ICT for Inclusion. And, and we had a challenge focused on um, Africa and focused on solving some of the challenges that people with disabilities have to getting education and therefore after education work. Um, and as a result of this, we had a couple of hundred entries. We eventually put 10 teams through a boot, boot camp and selected three winners. And um, they were a, a, a mixture of um, technology and also skills and learning. So the first prize was a, a technology company called Vinsight from Nigeria. Uh, and they, they created software using artificial intelligence, which allows people to use their mobile phones to access texts and, and, and literature so that people can literally have access to the things that they need in order to learn. The second was Virtual ENT, which is a South African based organization, and, and, and that's ENT being education and training. So this is aimed at people with intellectual disabilities, and they have been delivering virtual trainings. And then the final one uh, was actually one called Talking Charts, which was uh, was from a team in Kenya, and they were looking at creating um, a way of uh, vocalizing data visualizations for people who are blind through synthetic speech and automatic captioning. So um, these are the kind of tools that people need to be able to access the jobs that are being created in the digital economy. And, and so as an organization that is passionate about including people and passionate about skills, we're very happy to work in partnership to help create more skills uh, that can create more jobs. Uh, and, and, and that's really important for us. We believe that there is a shortage of skills and that the disability community have the aptitude, the entrepreneurial um, mindset and problem solving that our organizations desperately need. So um, we see it as a strategic advantage to be employing people with disabilities. So it's why we are participating in the ILO GBDN. It's why we are continuing to back initiatives like this. And I would encourage anyone that is interested in learning and technology that they engage too. Equally, we're teaching accessibility skills. And so in uh, the UK, we helped build an apprenticeship scheme for accessibility specialists. Because if we want to be inclusive, we also have to have the deep technology skills and expertise to build the systems in a way so that people with disabilities can use them. And there is a skill shortage in accessibility. The legislation that is being adopted across Europe and in places like Kenya also and across many parts of the world are making accessibility a mandatory requirement. And yet there aren't enough people that know what this means to be able to successfully implement the laws. Therefore, we need more accessibility specialists, not just as ATOS, but as society and an industry in general. This is a great opportunity for people to have a long-term meaningful career with a skill set that's going to be in high demand because if we look at the global population and demographics the world is getting older africa may have a a a, a, a relatively young population but the, the trend is getting older and for the rest of the world you know it's already considerably aging and age and disability are interrelated so uh, whichever way you look at it disability inclusion and accessibility a great opportunities and we hope that through engaging with you the GBDN and um, 
a community to teach skills that we can tap into this. So thank you very much. Thank you, Neil. Before you go off, may I ask you to share any lessons learned that you think others that are embarking on such an uh, initiative may benefit from? Oh, gosh. OK. Um, the, 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 this is a journey and, 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 and that it's, it's not a one shot deal. You know, doing accessibility, being inclusive is a is a attitudinal as well as a technical uh, undertaking and you need, you need to help facilitate cultural change and you also need to be constantly looking at the changing technology landscape because it's easy for sort of accessibility to be undone so if we wish to continue to allow people with disabilities to be successful in their jobs once they've got them we need to have that continuous quality process of making sure that we maintain the accessibility of systems as well as making them you know, interoperable with assistive technology at the beginning. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate your um, presentation this afternoon and all the insights and your learning. Uh, thank you for sharing with us. I will now just look at some of the questions that came through. And the one that has come through was for Accenture. If I may ask uh, Patricia to kindly um, respond to this one. Uh, the question is, how many students do you currently have in your cadet program and do you follow what the alumni do? Sure. Oh, thanks. Thank you um, for that question. Uh, we currently have 24 uh, in our current cohorts and uh, we do definitely follow up with our uh, alumni. We have actually had opportunities where we would invite some of them to come and speak, you know, to in some of our programs. So what we are also doing is that, you know, as a way of enhancing and improving our program, we are now working on a mentorship program. And, you know, the whole idea is also to get to get uh, the alumni, you know, to provide them an opportunity to also support and kind of, you know, work closely with uh, our current cohorts to, to ensure that, you know, they walk along this journey. They have been there, they understand it better. So working with the current cohorts, you know, on this journey will, will take it, you know, a long way. Thanks, hope I've answered the question. Thank you. No, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, so now, colleagues, I just want to also take you through some of the points that Neil had mentioned to us in his session. We can see that ATOS really identified uh, that persons with disabilities are often excluded from education due to social, cultural, and various other factors. And through the education and skills programs that they've been able to um, provide to these young persons, we can see that it's reduced and therefore closed barriers in terms of skills. And it's also enabled these uh, workers to enter the job market and we also note that it has had a positive ripple effect from uh, the person with the disability to their family members and to their caregivers as well. And uh, we also note that once again, similar to what Accenture has done, they've partnered with the German uh, organization and they started a boot camp. Um, and then the winners were selected in various categories of technology and intellectual disability, as well as um, they had a program that actually uh, supported the vocalizing of uh, data for persons who are blind. And of course, lessons learned and highlighted by Neil is that attitude and education is critical, as well as the support of technology. And he also highlighted that we do need to have more accessibility specialists, both in Africa as well as uh, globally.
and uh, also that this is not a once off but an ongoing work in progress that we need to do. So colleagues, this has been a great collaboration and great info sharing session. I also want to thank our speakers for their time and for sharing so gener generously with us this afternoon, as well as to the ILO and to Jürgen Mensa and his team for the excellent initiative that they've afforded uh, to both the global community and to Africa in particular. And I'm sure that you all will take forward these valuable insights and knowledge that was shared with us into your respective organizations so that you too can craft strategies to upskill and provide persons with disabilities, with employment uh, opportunities, with decent work, and so they may be integrated into mainstream business. Remember also that each of us has the capability of designing and implementing such quality programs. And we can leverage of the good work that our colleagues are doing and collaborate now both in Africa and globally. So I really thank you colleagues for your time and once again to our speakers for their time and preparations today. And I encourage you to go forward, meet people where they are. There is no one size fits all and it's continuous efforts and work in progress. So thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Thank you, Jürgen, and I'll hand over to you. Yeah, thank, thanks so much, Losh. And um, well, you summarized it really well, so I don't have to add anything, but I also just want to express my gratitude to the speakers. Uh, uh, who were with us in this uh, session, and I think it's it also came out quite clearly that you know the digital dimension of the future of work, the the works, the, the jobs we 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 perform, is getting more important. So it's good to see that you know the skills uh, skills training, employability initiatives, also taking that digital dimension of our work into account because. These, these are really the skills that are highly in demand uh, that that make people more competitive in the labor market, including, of course, uh, job candidate workers with disabilities. So thanks so much uh, for, for, for this session. Uh, as you said, Los, uh, much more to do, but it's a good start and very good practices that could be replicated, adapted in different contexts by different companies in different countries. So thanks so much. And throughout, I think, throughout today's sessions already, we have heard a lot about partnering, right? I, I think almost in every single presentation, there was some reference to some organization or some companies that the presenters, the speakers were working with to, to make something happening, um, to make something happen. Sorry, I'm getting too excited here. <laughs> um, so, so, so I think it's quite uh, timely that we now move into the session on partnering. Um, partnering to build disability confidence and move forward the disability inclusion agenda in Africa. So we will hear more about partnerships and how to collaborate with different um, actors. And this session will be moderated by Hendy Lavarilla, you who you have already seen uh, in, in this session on national business and disability networks, where she gave us an update or debrief basically on what happened in the workshop we had with national networks three weeks ago. I already want to express the gratitude. I know she will do a great job here in the moderation, but I just also want to take the opportunity to thank her already uh, for all the amazing work she has done to put this conference and also the workshop shop together. The heavy lifting was really done by her to make today's event happen and also the workshop we had three weeks ago. So thank you already, Handila, and the floor is yours for the moderation of the partnership session. Thank you very much, uh, Jürgen. Uh, bonjour et uh, rebonjour à tous. Good morning. Good afternoon, brother, and good afternoon to everybody here. I am Andy Lavarella, a consultant for people with disabilities at the ILO, and I wear glasses and a white shirt. It's a pleasure for me to moderate this fifth, fourth session, rather, of the conference that will discuss partnerships to build employer confidence in disabilities and advanced inclusion of people with disabilities in the world of work in Africa. 
is sessionable highlight partnerships between different stakeholders who have come together to develop and exchange inclusive practices and promote the employment of people who have disabilities. These partnerships create synergies between different actors involved and contribute a more accessible, inclusive and enabling working environment and world of work for people with disabilities. Through different examples, the speakers will share with us their experiences of partnerships with NGOs, companies, social actors, international development agencies, among others. So I'm pleased to welcome our six speakers for this fourth session. And I apologize in advance for any mistakes in translation. We have Seluman Doye, Project Manager for Employment and Disability Project, that's Humanity and Inclusion Senegal, Ola Enimoro, HR Director, and colleague Paul Agbay, Head of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at Unilever West Africa, Marise Maké, Training and Development Manager at L'Oreal South Africa, Annette Mars, who is Thematic Director for Economic Empowerment for the NGO Light for the World, Dr. Thomas Ogo, Regional Disability Advisor for GIZ, which is the German Agency for International Cooperation, and lastly, Greet Katert, Labour Rights Officer for the UN Global Compact. Before I give the floor to Soliman, I'll give you some practical and technical information of the session for those of you joining us now. So following the presentations, we will have a short Q and A session. Questions should be submitted through the Q and A box on Zoom. And I will see a list and then read them out to speakers. I would ask speakers to respect the time limits, which is seven minutes, and please turn off your microphone and camera when you're not speaking. So, Soliman Enduje, you are Project Manager at Humanity and Inclusion Senegal in 2021. Your organization launched stage two of the Employment and Disability Project to improve access to decent employment for people with disabilities in four African countries, Senegal, Benin, Morocco, and Tunisia. Could you please present your project and especially the partnerships and collaborations between the different stakeholders to improve the situation of people with disabilities in the world of work? Solomon, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I am Solomon Andoy. I'm not sure if you can see what I've just shared with you on the screen. I will try, I'm trying to show you a PowerPoint presentation. Yes, we can see the presentation, but could you also please start your camera so that we can see you too? Thank you. Yes, I can. Can you see me now? Personally, I cannot says the moderator. I will try again. If not, it is not a problem, says the moderator. I, I can do the sound, but not the video, I'm afraid. Can you see now? Stimmerman, no, there is no video. But if you share your screen, it's not a problem. We will follow your presentation. That's the most important thing, I think, isn't it? So here's the most important part of the presentation. I am Sermon Ndoui. I am a man. I have shaved head. 
I am the head of the project to in Senegal from Plum Disability. So we had our project stage one and now it's one stage two. So our organization, Humanity and Inclusion, HI, works with relevant groups, which you can see here. And we have a focus on vocational training. We work with the Ministry of Employment and we work with people with disabilities. There are also businesses involved in this. So to look at stage one, there were 51 companies and public institutions that recruited 94 people. We worked with the National Network of Persons with Disabilities in Senegal and in partnership with the High Council for Social Dialogue. And from that, we set up an NBDN. So going back to stage two and our objectives. So we want to improve access to decent employment for men and women with disabilities. This is through coordinated schemes. You can also see that we are also interested in these projects and we have we have we wish to have at least 350 people employed and 40 percent of these people will be women there are also cso's that are involved and structures across senegal In terms of the location, we are present in the Dakar region and all the departments in Dakar, also the Tears region and the Siguinchor region. We have partners, we have state, private sector, civil society, academic and technical financial partners. We work with, as I said, CSOs that help strengthen the implementation of our project and they can help take up the work and advance it. This is more the, the plan of habits, perhaps too long. So just to show you, since the start of this in 2021, we have helped A number of women and men see there are 100 people who have been registered at the project gateways, 46 of these were women, 77 people were guided into self-employment and helped in terms of financing. We have 34 people who registered on the public service platform. In terms of achievements, we work across three regions, Dakar, Tiers, and Siguinchor. We trained 68 actors and we worked with many partners. There are organizations for people with disabilities and who work with us in this project. So we have quite a number of partnerships. We also have a pool of experts in Senegal that are specialized in economic matters. And these people all work together and they do assessments of people with disabilities uh, 
with respect to work. We, we start these projects, but we depend on our partners to, to help us along the process and place people. So we're looking to roll this out across the whole country. And these groups are also willing to help people. So today we are working on validating a professional qualification reference framework, which will help disabled people with disabilities rather. And this will help people to be more and more guided in finding employment. If we look at our consultation frameworks, we have two levels of consultation with regional groups and then the tripartite work groups in the three regions. So these groups meet up monthly and these are the groups that we have worked with. We also have awareness raising activities. We We also have this approach to create the national, the NBDN in Senegal. And we have a platform to allow companies to collaborate and work with us. We try to strengthen capacities of all involved stakeholders. There are a number of companies that are already part of the programme but also countries that are companies rather that are interested in joining up. So the role of HI in the NBDN, we really want to implement what we're doing. Our mission really is to, to organize and, and build capacity and bring everyone together. In terms of successes, we found that many companies were, in, were involved but didn't work together. So this was important to bring all the people together. So we managed to bring together all the social workers and the state employment department together to work on this. We have the employment services, community development services. Suleiman, the moderator interrupts. Excuse me, but you've gone over your time. Should I ask you please to wrap it up? Thank you. Yes. I'm just about to finish I'm on the last slide. So I could talk about the subject all day, really. But this project is, is very exciting and something that, that we're moving forward with. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting us to speak here today. And we'll continue this process. Thank you. Thank you to the man for that presentation. The Employment and Disability Programme launched by HI was very interesting. As was referred to this morning, the future implementation of a national network, the NBD in, in Senegal, including your organization and social dialogue. It was also interesting to hear more about the project that helps 
several hundred people with disabilities and the gender focus as well that this project has. So thank you for speaking to us. Now we're going to move on to our next two speakers who represent Unilever in West Africa. So Mr. Ola N. Morrow, Director of Human Resources and Paul Agbay, Head of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. Unilever is a member of the GBDN and has adopted a number of initiatives and practices to promote the inclusion of people with disabilities, notably in West Africa. Could you please talk about your partnerships with notably the NGOs, so Sight Savers, Light for the World, but also the company Safaricom, who spoke this morning in the second session. Could you also explain how this partnership has can help to develop and improve disability inclusion practices? Ola and Paul, you have the floor. Thank you. You know, Unilever story in terms of our partnership um, with with some of the people who have made us made some level of success on our you know journey to provide um, a lot of um, you know accommodation, if you like, for people with disability in our workplace. But I like to start with uh, you know the purpose of um, our organization uh, as Unilever. Our story is the same everywhere; is very consistent. Uh, our purpose is to make sustainable living commonplace. Um, what that means is whether with our people, uh, we believe that people with purpose strive. We also believe that our brands with purpose will grow, and companies with purpose, you know, will last. Uh, but if I stay on our topic today, uh, one of the key pillars of, of our purpose is also uh, improving the health uh, of the planet, but more importantly, contributing to uh, the fair, you know, um, to a fairer, more socially inclusive world. Uh, so you, you would see in terms of um, how this now connects with what we want, you know, um, what we're talking about today is the bit around the equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, and for us in this space, um, you know, we wanted to make sure that we accelerate, you know, the diversity of the representation at all levels. Uh, but more importantly, on people with disability, we have called out that we want to be, uh, be able to have 5% of our workforce uh, to be made up of people with disability by the year 2025. So what that means in real sense is that, you know, out of the 5%, we do know that a number of people in the workplace today uh, that suffer one form of disability or the other, aside from, you know, physical disability that, um, you know, we, we see, there are a number of other, you know, non-physical disability that we know people suffer. And our aim is to make sure that we educate people to be able to self-declare uh, about 2.5% of our employee globally, uh, we anticipate would have one declaration or the other for us to be able to make appropriate accommodation for them uh, to be able to be effective. Why the other 2.5%, we aim to continue to uh, get in a number of people with disability uh, into our business. So in all, in 2025, we aim to be able to have 5% of our workforce um, as people with uh, disability. So we do know to be able to do this, that there's, it, it's not, you have to be systematic. Um, and so we also have, um, some audacious vision that we have created. Uh, one of it, you know, is to also say that we want to be number one employer of choice for people with disability in the same year, 2025. So with that ambition in mind, it means you now to get to work and be systematic to prepare, you know, uh, the workplace 
and the people to be able to achieve that. So we um, follow this in three pronged approach. So the first one is to get our house in order uh, by creating uh, the level of accessibility, preparing the workplace, whether from the point of infrastructure point of view or from the point of policies, education, that helps people to be more inclusive um, and accept you know, um, this, this um, uh, diversity that we're trying to, to create. And also to be able to understand the specific nature of disability and create the level of accommodation that is re reasonable enough for people to, to thrive. The second part of what we uh, 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 you know, decide to do as, as part of our, uh, our game plan is also to create and push for culture of psychological safety and true inclusion. Um, and this again, you know, involves that we need to do a number of things around policy, around education, around helping people, um, you know, to see things differently. And then we then say we're going to be measuring our progress uh, against um, the ambition that we have set, you know, for ourselves, um, you know, at the beginning to say by 2025 we're going to be five. I mean, five percent of our employees um will be uh, people with disability so we to be able to do this we were lucky to um identify site savers uh that has been extremely credible partner that we have uh, uh, been working with uh, recall what i said in terms of preparing even you know, our organization itself from infrastructure to identifying um, all the things that we need to do in terms of uh, accommodation. So site savers um, happen to now be our technical, provide the technical support for us. And so they help us, you know, when we started this journey in 2020 um, to, to do a site disability audit uh, where they look at our physical infrastructure they also looked at our policies um, and see how, how can we make even the employee policy uh, to be more inclusive and welcoming of you know, the different diversity that we wanted to drive. Also, they did this for us in Nigeria head office. And over time, when we took some of the learnings, we also did another one in our Ghana office. And then they also help us you know, in the area of uh, capability building running capability building sessions for our leaders, for our line managers, and for the entire organization to be able to identify different relationships that we need to build with people who are different from us um, in order to be able to accommodate um, everyone and seeing that th that difference that we have put together is actually what would drive you know, the, the level of productivity that we, we wanted. Uh, so uh, all the bits that we're doing are upskilling uh, PWD, which is even the most important thing. Uh, if you listen to some of the previous speakers, there have always been issues around how work ready uh, this population that we're talking about. So in, in most cases, because of the non-inclusion in education, in training, in, in um, access to um, readiness uh, for, for this population, uh, you do struggle with the way our job is configured. And so you do need to have partners who is also going to help you to identify where the, this population is. But aside from identifying the population, it's also helping to develop the skill set that is you know, going to get these people um, you know, work ready. And so we, we have made a lot of uh, progress on that, and I will leave Paul to talk about that later. Um, and so site savers have been you know, a credible partner for us. Uh, we also have partnered with some universities, you know, um, specific areas in the universities that focus on people with disability to also help us with capability building and also uh, talent supply. The other uh, interesting partner that uh, is evolving and very strong is uh, the Nigeria Business Disability Network, 
the Nigeria part of uh, Unilever uh, has been playing strong and pivotal role, you know, partnering with NDB, uh, MBDN um, in Nigeria, especially in the area of advocacy, in the area of sharing different experiences, you know, and, and so on and so forth. So um, I'm going to leave Paul to just talk in terms of some of the winning uh, initiatives um, and how, uh, you know, some of the effort I've put to, to uh, in place is working, especially in terms of numbers, progress that I've made on num numbers in the diverse representation, accessibility and accommodation, capability, culture, procedures, and policies that we have introduced, and also some of the few works that we've done on advocacy and allyship. Paul, if you're there. Hi, Ola. Hi, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. I hope you can all hear me. My name is Paul Agai. I work with Unilever and I lead the EDNI agenda across our West African business. I'm in a gray shirt, blue cut hair, and I am um, call it chocolate and complex conservative. So Ola has Ola has started off by sharing some of the key partnerships that we have engaged across West Africa in driving our EDI agenda, more specifically around driving inclusion of persons with disability within our West Africa markets. Here to date, we have about 19 PWDs in West Africa. And this is, um, this is maybe let me call it a benefit or some of the results we are getting from all the other initiatives we have taken around uh, carrying out the site disability audits and then actually putting in place the necessary, the right level of infrastructure. On, on our side, just like Ola said, we have a commitment, and this is a global commitment, not mandated by a government regulation, to have 5% of our workforce made up of uh, persons with disability by the year 2025. And we are very, very um, passionate about this and driving this with so much energy. The other area is around the accessibility and accommodation. So all across our sites in West Africa, we have worked with our engineering teams to sort of re-engineer our sites to make them more disability friendly. In Nigeria, for instance, the ground floor of our offices are reserved for persons with disability. On all of our sites, we have um, dedicated parking lots to persons with disability. We have installed ramps and handrails at um, very, very crucial areas of our sites for people with some fiscal mobility challenges. And then also, at the start or on ascending the staircase, there is a sound prompt or sound signal notifying people that there's a stairway here and the need for them to, to make use of the handrails. Around capability and culture, it, this is an area that we continue to drive rigorously to ensure that the culture of diversity and inclusivity is held on or is imbibed into every single employee of, of, of Unilever across West Africa. So the International Day of Persons with Disability is one of the days that we commemorate every year in the past about five years. And this, we again, we do with states, different states and social agencies in all of our markets to make sure that we are not driving the agenda alone, but we are also having the support of other agencies. We launched, um, we call it a, a, a learning, online uh, learning platform. Excuse me, Paul, so sorry. Sorry to interrupt you, but uh, I will ask you to briefly conclude since we are exceeding the allocated time. Thank Very you. Very well. Thank you. I'll be done in 60 seconds. So we launched an online learning platform Thank to you. equip um, line managers, HR, and other colleagues on how to manage or deal with persons with disability. Under our procedure and policy, Ola spoke about the self-disclosure that we the self-disclosure that we launched. So this, we encourage employees with some form of disability to openly and freely disclose their disability. So we are able to make the necessary accommodation available for them. We introduced the referral policy and this referral policy was quite novel to us, mainly to encourage employees to refer people into the organization. For every PWD or person with disability who is referred to the organization, 
and gets hired or goes through the process and gets hired, the employee is rewarded with about a thousand, a thousand euros thereabouts. This is just to get employees to understand the ambition and understand how important this agenda is to us as a business. And then finally, we spoke about it, our partnership or engagement with the Nigeria Business Disability, Nigeria Business Disability Network. And this is a very, very important, uh, important group for us. Last year, we won, uh, were adjudged most disability friendly company in Nigeria. Just recently, about a week ago, we were also adjudged, uh, we received the award of most inclusive company in Nigeria. And this is an award which was sponsored by CIPM and for, for the private sector. And thanks to all the partners we have worked with in this area, talk of site savers, the academic institutions, and then some of the state and social agencies there are. So this is the Unilever story on how we are engaging partners to drive um, PWD inclusion in our company. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul, and thank you very much, uh, Ola. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this uh, uh, presentation. And uh, with no further delay, I will uh, now switch to, I will uh, call on uh, the next speaker, who is uh, Marise McKay. So, uh, sorry, I will switch uh, into French. So, uh, Marise, uh, ce matin, vous nous avez fait... Marise, this morning, you shared a number of initiatives which were set up by L'Oréal to favor inclusion of persons with disabilities within your enterprise. And so we're very happy to learn more about the partnerships set up with local companies to favor the inclusion of persons with disabilities. Marise, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Angela. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me again. Um, I'll try to be as concise as possible and engage uh, as much as possible um, in the chat with some Q&A. So I am Maurice McKay. Um, for those of you that weren't on the earlier session, I have lots of hair, uh, so long black curly hair. I have thick eyebrows. I have red lipstick on and I'm wearing a black choker necklace as well as a black blazer. So I'll go straight into it. Can you all see my presentation, Andela? Can you see my presentation? Yes, we can see it. Wonderful, thank you so much. Okay, so just very quickly, I'll recap. Um, once again, like I said, if anybody missed uh, this morning session. So with, within the L'Oreal mission around diversity, equity and inclusion, before I go into our partnership initiatives, really our, our priorities around four pillars being gender equity and LGBTQI+, uh, as well as socioeconomic and multicultural origins. Uh, then we've got disability, which is absolutely why I'm here and very happy to share, engage and, and learn from everybody else as well. And then we've got age and generations as well. Um, who is this tailored for? Um, so we, we speak to three targets specifically, that being our employers, it starts at home, right? Um, and our consumers, uh, as well as our communities. And I'll touch on a little bit with our communities today. Um, that somehow does by default also extend onto the impact onto our consumers. Um, but really it is our ambitions around disability for L'Oreal is to accelerate um, the inclusion of, of people with disability into our organization uh, that aligned to our global mandate, but also aligned to local legislation, but not just because it's legislation, because ultimately, and this was reinforced as well, I believe in the previous conversations that it's absolutely imperative um, for the sake of business, for a thriving business, um, having a diverse population within our organization is ultimately what drives our innovation, right? Um, and it's some, that's something that we absolutely pride ourselves on at L'Oreal. But going into, you know, speaking more toward our partnerships and, and what that means for us. So globally, and, and this is a little bit of global opening up on the global front. So when we look at when we talk about partnering to build disability confidence um, and move forward the disability inclusion agenda for us, um, yes, as, as a company, as an organization, 
but overall as, as a nation and on a larger scale, right, contributing to our communities. So L'Oreal has 74 solid solidarity sourcing projects globally, um, and that has been cascaded into 141 local initiatives in 28 countries um, addressing people with disabilities. So partnering with responsible suppliers who share our commitments is one of our priorities. And that helps us, and it, it speaks to a question that was addressed to me in this morning's uh, session, really around how do we ensure that we leveraging, we're extending our footprint, um, that we're reaching people on the ground at a grassroots level, uh, but also ensuring that we're driving this agenda forward. And it's through these initiatives, it's through these partnerships, understanding what is within our control, what is within our expertise, and leaning on others who absolutely are qualified um, and very willing and open to share. So we've got an example of a brand cause, and um, we've actually rolled up with quite a few brand causes um, with different brands. And that's one way for us to absolutely reach uh, the team, the people on the ground, our consumers, right? It's through partnering with organizations who are aligned to our values when it comes to um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And one of the brand causes that is absolutely, that's live right now, um, and if you're in the South African context, um, and I'm not quite sure the reach, but I'm sure globally as well to a certain extent, um, is the Maybelline Brave Together campaign that the brand team is in partnership with SADAC here in South Africa. So that's the South African Depression and Anxiety um, Association. And that really is to ensure free counseling and access for the people who otherwise would not have had access to that. So when we speak about disability, obviously understanding that it's the visible and the invisible components of disability that we are, are geared to address. And when it comes to the invisible, it's, um, it's more speaking toward the mental health issues, right? And for us, um, we're seeing that a lot of prevalence amongst the youth and Maybelline being quite a young and dynamic um, youth brand has been doing a lot of campus initiatives, a lot of campus activations in partnership with SADAC and have, um, have allowed for this period during Mental Health Awareness Month for, for youth and, and anybody really to have uh, free access to a counselor, a person on the other end of a line who is able to, um, to, to reach out to you and connect with you in a time of, of distress. So that's one of the, the initiatives that I, I think you know, we really just want to extend and, and make sure we leverage a little bit further. Secondly, uh, Heindel, I'm not quite sure. I do have a video that comes up next. I do hope it plays with sound. So I'm going to give it a shot and we'll see from there. So this next, um, this next uh, slide showcases um, a very proud initiative uh, for us here at L'Oreal. So it's in partnership with, and you'll see um, Lerata does a beautiful um, illustration and she talks quite beautifully to the actual project and the partnership with the Dream House. Um, it's called, we call it Dream House and it's in partnership with Pretoria Workshop for the Blind. Um, and they are based at our factory here in South Africa. So L'Oreal has three sites in South Africa. We have our factory, our distribution center and our head office. Um, and uh, at, our, at our factory, uh, we have this partnership in, in place today. Uh, sorry, Mary, no, but we don't have this. You don't have the sound? No. Um, I'm trying to see. Is it something I would need to control on my side? Uh, well, can I can actually share with I sound. Know, I'm not sure. Maybe if you can increase the sound from your side. Mm. So I'm going uh, to try. Yeah, if I may come in, I think uh, Marie. Uh, thanks for trying. I think you might uh, have to reshare your screen and tick a yes. box that says something like "computer sound included." Similar to Teams, right? I'm going to do that very quickly. Sorry, everybody. Yeah. 
Yeah, there we go. This should help. Do you see the presentation before I click start? Uh, yes, you can play uh, start. Thank you. Good. Uh, well, Marys, the, the video is still on, on pause. So uh, maybe you can just uh, explain to us the content of this video briefly. Sure, 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 sure. So Thank sorry you. about Thank that, everybody. So but ultimately, in partnership with the Dream House um, and Pretoria Workshop for the Blind, we uh, we outsource the packaging of some of our relaxer kits, um, as well as the packaging of our um, mas mascara cases to ensure that it can be stored um, within the retail environment because sometimes they, uh, they arrive into South Africa as singles and they need to be carded. Um, so that's the start of it. But also, as you, if you may know, or you, or you might, might not know that the components of a relaxer kit um, are quite extensive. So there's multiple components. So ensuring that those are packaged um, quite nicely and ready for, for shelves. And really, I think towards the end of this video, and, um, and I'll make sure we try to get it shared, is that it's to ensure um, dignity and income. Um, and the Dreamhouse teams are included into the L'Oreal workspace um, and also into the canteen that have their designated areas. So really feeling part of a larger team um, with, with multiple, multiple um, disabilities. And um, there, are about a, there are about 30 to 35 people today um, that we currently have from Dreamhouse that are supporting us in that in that function. And that's it from me. I'm, I'm happy to take on any more questions, but those are just um, two of our, our, our more, more recent and ongoing initiatives and partnerships. Um, there's quite a there's quite a few more, uh, but with all intents and purposes, these are the ones that we focused on today in the interest of time. Thank you so much, everybody. Merci, merci beaucoup, uh, Maurice, pour, Thank you so uh, much, Maurice, for this very interesting and inspiring presentation and for having also shared the parts of the video concerning your partnership with Dreamhouse, which enables you to include persons with disability within your factories. Thank you very much. Now we're going to move on to our next speaker, who's Annika Mars. Annika, you are thematic director for Light for the World. Your organization developed many partnerships with companies in Africa. Could you present the work in your organization and explain how these partnerships help reinforce the working of these uh, enterprises in persons with disabilities and promote inclusiveness of these people on your enterprise. We're very impatient to hear what you have to say. And uh, also, thank you very much for, for inviting us uh, to share some of our experiences. Um, so my name is, uh, is Anneke Maersen. I'm a, a white woman, 50 plus, wearing glasses um, and uh, being very happy to be here with you. Um, I wanted to share my screen with you. There we go. And I wanted to, uh, to zoom in of uh, the partnership that Light for the World has with uh, private sector actors with a strong focus on building disability confidence. Uh, so we do that um, already in partnership uh, with uh, NUDIPU, which is the organization, umbrella organizations of persons with disabilities in Uganda and uh, with, with many others, which I will share a bit more about. So uh, the Make 12.4% Work initiative, uh, it was already shared with, by uh, Rosemary uh, in this morning, uh, that 12.4% stands for the, the percentage of persons with disabilities in Uganda, according to the last census. 
Um, this initiative was born out of a process of co-creation and learning. Uh, when we came together with a small group of young people with disabilities uh, that was actually looking at the challenge of why is it that many persons with disabilities, especially young people with disabilities, graduates, they can't um, access employment or they can't access all kinds of lively opportunities that are out there. Um, so the group went on a learning expedition and, and what they actually found out is that the major reason is lack of disability confidence. And not only amongst the private sector, but also amongst um, government actors, also amongst a wide range of civil society actors that are active in the field of livelihood development. Um, so they came up with the idea to, to actually build, to raise uh, momentum around disability inclusion, where organizations, be it private sector, be it government actors, be it civil society, they could sign up to make 12.4% work. Uh, and as they would sign up, they would actually show their commitments and become ambassadors around disability inclusion. And then uh, we would support them uh, when they signed up uh, on the how of disability inclusion. So, um, so that uh, was launched in 2018 and a lot of demands came. Uh, and many organizations signed up and they were really interested to learn more about disability inclusion. Um, so that's when we came up with this small group of young people again with the disability inclusion facilitator model as we call it now. Uh, the idea of disability inclusion facilitators, they are all young people uh, with different types of impairments themselves, and they are trained and mentored to become disability inclusion facilitators, where they would um, then train companies, organizations on the how of disability inclusion. So this way, um, they can actually show their ability in action. Uh, when they train groups of people who can be managers, who can be uh, all kinds of staff. So there's an immediately uh, a mindset change about what they can do. It's also, uh, it builds their capacity to do self-advocacy, uh, to really go out there uh, and be uh, actually the change they want to see. And also they were able, or they are able to, um, to use their lived experience to be able to give very practical advice to others. Uh, so when we trained uh, groups of disability inclusion facilitators, uh, we do that uh, using um, a curriculum that we call the Disability Inclusion Academy. Uh, we also train them on um, what we call a number of steps of engagement, where actually the disability inclusion facilitators, they build partnerships uh, with the members that sign up. So each of them has a portfolio with different companies, and then they build relationships with, that, with those companies. So when they go out to meet, uh, for example, the HR manager or um, other staff of the company, first of all, um, they have to understand the company very well. So how big is the company? What kind of functions are there? What kind of positions, job positions are there where persons with disabilities could possibly be included? And also in their engagement with the company, they would also present disability inclusion as a, a business case. And uh, by doing so, the company or the organization could then um, what we call sign a proof of commitment or sign uh, the, the, the charter of the Uganda Business and Disability Network. And that proof of commitment is actually signed by the manager of the company or the organization. So once that uh, commitment is there, uh, the engagement continues um, where we uh, have a very practical tool that we call the disability readiness checklist. Um, it's, um, more, it's based on the Global Business and Disability Network uh, self-assessment form, but it's very contextualized. So we can also use it with um, sm some smaller companies here, here in Uganda. And it's very practical and it results in a very concrete action plan. Um, very often one of the actions is that the company would like to hire and get more people with disabilities on board. Um, so we do a lot of trainings, Rosemary also mentioned it, um, for HR staff on how to go about inclusive hiring processes, but also general disability awareness trainings for, for all staff. 
And all of this is done by the disability inclusion facilitators. What we also offer is a work experience placement um, program. And we have learned that that is very helpful to build disability confidence where graduates with disabilities uh, who might have been out of work for some time already um, are, are linked to companies that would like to be more inclusive in their hiring uh, practices uh, for a job experience placement, a work experience placement of about three to six months. And during that placement, uh, the disability inclusion facilitators are again are there to do coaching, to do mentoring, to do training, to advise, to make sure that, um, yeah, that it's also a learning experience and a positive experience for all. And um, the facilitators, they are also responsible to identify good practices in their portfolio so that they can be, those practices can be documented. So uh, what did we achieve? Um, I'm here now focusing especially on uh, the achievements with private sector. Um, um, almost one and a half thousand staff of private sector actors are trained on disability inclusion. And um, in Make 12.4% Work, 67 private sector actors signed up. We have a total membership of over 150, but 67 of them are um, companies. They can be bigger companies like Coca-Cola, but they can also be smaller companies uh, on the ground. Uh, 30 disability inclusion assessments have taken place, uh, resulting in those action plans that I've been explaining. And also we have been able to facilitate 62 work experience placements. And our experience is that it's not only the placements, but very often uh, the people are also retained. Um, overall, we have been able to reach out to over 7,000 young people with disabilities, not only by including them um, in work experience placements, but especially also um, to have them included in all kinds of youth employment and livelihood programs that are ongoing, that are mainstream programs that with the support of the facilitators have become more inclusive in their implementation. Yeah, so what did we learn from all of this? Um, we learned that it's extremely important. Partnerships are key. Uh, in the first place, partnerships with organizations of persons with disabilities to make sure that um, they are actually in the lead. Um, also, uh, what I didn't mention that when the disability inclusion facilitators are selected, they're always introduced to us by organizations of persons with disabilities and often also part of uh, the OPDs. Um, also, it's very important what I mentioned, that there is this management commitment to inclusion. What we very often see is that there are some people in the company that are very uh, enthusiastic about inclusion, which is great. But if we want to take this process further uh, and really see it as organizational change, it's very important that management also commits. Um, further, we have learned that it's very important to make disability inclusion tangible focus on um, quick wins as well, so that uh, different people in the organization, they see change and also celebrate success. Um, so we do a lot of work to, uh, to show the good practices of the companies so that we actually inspire others to also join and become more inclusive. The learning by doing element is also really important. So that's why the work experience placements also work very well. So um, for the work readiness of the job seeker, but also for the company. Um, and um, last but not least, uh, we also learned it's important to move beyond the wage employment, looking for those jobs, but so, also looking at- Sorry, I'm not to interrupt you, Anneke, yes. but you will have to, to wrap up. Yes, Please. so great, I'm done. Thank you very much. Um, we see here a picture with Perfect. a group of young people being very inspired. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anneke. Merci, merci beaucoup uh, d'avoir partagé. Thank you for sharing the work of your organization, which contributes to help businesses, help people with disabilities, and also helps people to get on to the job market. Now we're going to continue with our next speaker, who represents GIZ, which is the German Agency for International Cooperation. So, Dr. Thomas Ongolo, you're the Regional Disability Advisor at GIZ. 
Could you please share with us the partnerships developed by GIZ with companies and other stakeholders to promote the inclusion of people with disabilities in the world of work in Africa? And please, Thomas, please be brief or respect your time limit as we have very little time left. Thank you very much. Okay. You have the floor. Okay, thanks very much um, for the ILO team for um, also reaching out to GIZ. Um, I'll also be brief. Uh, <clears throat> um, GIZ is part of the German Agency for Development Cooperation, and much of our work is um, inspired by uh, the SDGs, the UNRCPD, <clears throat> and of course, um, and the German government um, um, uh, foreign policy that promotes um, a feminist policy. And um, I think um, it's important that also working in Africa, um, we are also inspired by the, um, the African Union instrument that is the African um, Disability Protocol, which also promotes the rights of persons with disability. I think those are some of the things that informs uh, development corporations in Africa. Um, about the core area, I'll jump straight away into the core area of the question. I mean, how is uh, GIZ promoting partnerships towards uh, disability inclusion and, um, and, and confidence within, um, 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 within, the, uh, within um, uh, the private sector so that a person with disability can access jobs? I think I'll be looking at three areas. The first one is uh, our approach towards multilateral cooperation. Uh, GRZ works closely with um, the ILO, uh, especially uh, contributing to the global uh, business, business disability uh, network. Uh, we have worked closely towards um, establishing national networks in India. And of course, currently uh, also present in this uh, conference is a uh, representation from Ethiopia, where we have seen um, GRZ supporting national disability uh, business forums being reactivated and reestablished. I think that's one approach which we also use. Also, you can also link it up to our work at the regional level, especially working with the African Union um, system. That is, um, there is an African Union Development Agency, NEPAD, um, which has a, an initiative called uh, Skills Initiative for Jobs in Africa. And uh, this um, is part of the uh, the, 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 pr the priority area to ensure that a person, I mean, the youth of Africa have access to jobs. I mean, our contribution in this particular form of partnership is to is supporting the, um, the African skills portal for youth and employment. This is a, um, a knowledge management hub. And as GRZ and uh, in, in, in part of the partnership, we have made sure that the content in this portal have knowledge and practices around disability inclusive jobs, disability inclusive trainings, and disability inclusive um, uh, 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 best practices. Um, the second approach in terms of partnership, oh, which um, we, we have also been very, very involved with in, is at the regional level. Uh, GRZ um, um, is present almost in two thirds of the African countries, and uh, and um, there is one initiative, um, DSA Aid, which is um, Digital Skills Accelerator Africa. These are German-based companies working in the continent of Africa, investing, and um, through this platform. Uh, DSAA, we have seen several uh, companies committing to themselves to disability inclusion in terms of digital screen training. We have seen, for example, in Ghana, um, uh, uh, Rwanda, Kenya, um, around about six countries in Africa where uh, businesses, German businesses, have established training, especially the digital skills training. We have seen Amalitech in Ghana and the uh, Zubi African uh, opening up inclusive training and opening up trainings that have opened up um, jobs for persons with disability uh, in, in areas like Amazon web, uh, training like uh, testing and, 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 and verifications of softwares. And, and, and this is real ground, groundbreaking in terms of opening up jobs uh, for persons with disability. Um, as we speak, almost up to um, 100 of 100 youths with disability have um, acquired jobs 
uh, through this, this, this kind of network. A good example is in Kakuma, a refugee camp in, uh, in, in Northern Kenya, where Azubi Africa based in Ghana, offering training that includes person disability and getting jobs and Amazon web. And while still based in the refugee camps, they're able to, to get to gain get again for the income. And the other aspect which I think is also important and which has uh, 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 supported uh, which the GIZ has supported, which makes this in the, um, this partnership approach um, very crisp and, and, and realistic is our partnerships um, uh, uh, at national level. Um, as GIZ, we have different um, um, different um, programs and which go across countries. And one example is a global project collaborating with E4D, Employment for Development, and uh, Employment for Development operates almost in 10 African countries. And through the, our collaboration, um, we were able to establish one interesting approach, and that is having a, a disability inclusive ecosystem. And as Alia mentioned in the morning, uh, the example of the Bridge Academy in Kenya, in the ecosystem, there are several um, 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 key pillars. That is having the public sector. In other words, government being part of, of that ecosystem, providing um, training environments. Uh, the private sector being part of the environment. And, 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 and the organizations of personal disability being part of that ecosystem. There's also development cooperation partners. For example, now in, in, in the Kenyan example, there's E4D, there's a global project, and there's also uh, the European Union, which makes part of that ecosystem. So, so in the experiences of Kenya, um, the organizations of persons with disability plays a pivotal point in terms of sensitization, in terms of making people with disability confident and in terms of recruitment. The Kenyan government, for example, in this particular case, has provided the, the institutions. And of course, sight savers and organizations of the blind, UDPK, and, uh, and, and Cisco, for example, the, from the private sector, uh, is, has been able to provide the curriculum and, uh, and, and jobs, and especially for the, for the part of uh, Safaricom and, uh, and, and Santa Charter. So, so that ecosystem is one approach in terms of partnership whereby uh, if you make uh, an environment, an ecosystem which is inclusive, um, um, a person with disability can easily have an inclusive job environment and training. Um, it's, it's this particular model and a partnership I think has shown that up to um, almost right now, by the end of this year, almost 150 uh, persons with disability will have acquired jobs in terms of, I mean, training into jobs. Uh, it within the private sector. We have replicated this approach of partnership right now here in South Africa uh, by supporting one of the organizations for persons with disabilities, South African National Council, uh, in terms of opening up uh, inclusive jobs uh, through training. But lastly, one of the other approaches, which I think is also important, is that recognizing that uh, the private sector is an important ent entity. And um, here in South Africa, we have a collaboration, in other words, GRZ collaborating with the private sector, which is a social enterprise, uh, whereby in a, in, a, in, a, in a funding mechanism called IDDP, uh, Integrated Development Partnership with the private sector, where the private sector contribute 50% and GRZ contribute 50% towards training of, 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 of persons with disability, towards jobs with reassurance that there's going to be learnership, there's going to be uh, transition into job. So, so these are three key pillars, I mean, three key approaches in terms of partnership that we'd like to share. In terms of lessons learned, what's the way forward? We see this approach um, being replicated. We think of, we, we see it being scaled up uh, into the Eastern African region in, in Tanzania, Kenya in the next couple of uh, years. We see, for example, the Cisco training which has been very successful in Asia, uh, US, uh, with so many trainings across Africa, uh, having an inclusive model uh, in them, such that the mainstream 
uh, Cisco training, whether in Cairo, whether in Kenya, Mombasa, uh, uh, um, uh, include a personal disability in those mainstream uh, 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 training. And lastly, uh, I think it's also important. I think it's also important to recognize that uh, that that. Uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, through other partnership that we have had from by through Atos and um, and uh, Orange and and other uh, other companies, we'll be able to create more sensitization, especially the IT challenge, and uh, and, and and give uh, youth with disability in Africa that it is possible to to open up jobs and for companies to be confident with people with disability. Thank you. Okay. Webinar. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for your presentation. And um, I will now uh, switch uh, to French. Merci, uh, merci beaucoup uh, pour cette présentation qui était uh, très. The presentation. It was very rich and allows us to see the commitment and efforts of GIZ in helping persons with disabilities in the world of work, the numerous partnerships that have been developed with businesses, the various initiatives that GIZ takes part in, notably in setting up a national network of persons with disabilities, and the ecosystem, the inclusive ecosystem that was put in place in Kenya was very interesting too. I'm now going to move on to our last speaker for this session, Greet Katert. You're the Labour Rights Officer at the UN Global Compact. We would like to hear more about the work of the Global Compact's local networks in Africa with respect to inclusion and disability. We would also like to hear about you using national national uh, organizations Yeah, sure today. So I'm gonna keep it very short today. Um, I'm representing here indeed the UN, UN, UN Global Compact, the United Nations Global Compact, which is a UN initiative. So it's linked to the United Nations, but we are the largest corporate sustainability initiative in the world. So currently we have almost 17,000 companies who are working with us. So they're participating in the initiative. And we have 65 local networks. So as you said, we have 11 local networks in the region, in Africa, with uh, five regional hubs, like we call them. We have hubs in South Africa, in Nigeria, in Kenya, Morocco, and Egypt. So from these local networks, we work directly with the companies in these in, in the region, in the in, at country level, but we support um, our local networks from the office in New York. So we work very closely together between the, the global office and the local networks. So we represented in almost all countries. Uh, we also represent sec uh, different sectors. Um, I am also very pleased to see that many of our participating companies are uh, have spoken here today. So uh, it shows really that, that these companies are taking actions on inclusion. Um, so it's really I'm really glad to see all of them here. So we are an initiative, a sustainability initiative. So companies, when they join the UN Global Compact, um, they agree to align their strategies with 10 principles. These principles include human rights, labor rights, environment, and anti-corruption. So these principles are also based on international conventions. Uh, so for example, for labor, there um, we have four labor principles and they're fully aligned with the fundamental principles and rights at work. So uh, principle six is referring to no discrimination. So that's a specific principle that is also very relevant in our discussion today, but of course also our human rights principles in which companies uh, commit that they will take action to protect and respect uh, human rights, but that it also will take action to support human rights. And that's a very important aspect. So we really uh, help our companies to implement ongoing human rights due diligence. So really to understand where the risks are and to take action, but also on inclusion, on no discrimination, to take action and also to report on it. So that is very important. As you see here, again, the, the 10 principles, but we also support our companies to take action around the 17 sustainable development goals. 
Now, what is really important, how do we support our companies and how do we really um, um, support them to take action around these 10 principles is, first of all, we try to connect them. Companies are really interested to learn from each other. Like we see also today, it's very interesting to hear from companies what they're doing, what, what did work, what didn't work, what are the challenges, the opportunities. I think that is really important. So we have with our local networks at, at a national level in, in, in the region, we organize peer learning groups. So sessions where companies come together where they discuss specific topics. So on the labor and human rights, there, there are also discussions on, 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 uh, on inclusion. So that's specifically very interesting for companies who want to learn from each other. Another important thing that we also do as Global Compact is uh, developing tools and guidance to help companies to learn. So um, also to understand what you can do to, to make progress. It's about the learning and the tools. I think it's important also to mention that all companies are welcome in our initiative, small companies, big companies, but also companies who are just starting on their sustainability journey, really want to make progress and, and really want to learn. So we have really uh, programs for all types of companies, wherever they are in their sustainability journey. But it's also important that we also um, develop thought leadership, that, that uh, companies that have taken a lot of actions, that they can show this, that we also share this with the world. So, and that's also, I see that many of our leading companies here are also represented today. And then last but not least, we also ask our companies to communicate because it's not just um, participating in this initiative, companies are also be accountable for the actions that they take. So we, from next year on, we will have a mandatory reporting system. It exists already now that companies have to, have to report on our 10 principles, but from next year on, it will be mandatory to report on our 10 principles. So there will be uh, questions on human rights, but also, for example, on the no, no discrimination topic. So, and it goes uh, beyond just a policy commitment, it's also the actions that companies are taking. And this will be fully transparent on our website. So all the information from companies will be available. So I have a slide here, what I said, it's really to drive impact, it's to scale ambitious action and to measure progress. So through the communication of progress, like I explained. I've included here also two guides, two tools that are very useful and that I would like to, to refer to. We have developed together with the International Labour Organization a guide for business, a very practical guide in which it explains what actions companies can take, but also um, explaining why it's so important to take action on, on including people with disabilities at the work floor. And then a new tool that is upcoming, uh, this will be launched um, this month, is on our principle six, uh, elimination of discrimination in respect of employment and occupation, where companies can find a lot of guidance, but also examples. It did also include uh, specific examples for small and medium enterprises. So keep an eye out on our website. All these tools are available for all, so it's publicly available. Um, keep an eye on it. I have in included a link here to our website where you can find more information. I'm not going to go into details of specific examples from the region because I have seen also that um, there were already many of our of our um, companies that have been represented here. So um, because of the matter of time, I will keep it here. Thank you so much for the invitation and uh, happy to, to respond to any questions you might have. Thank you, Haendira. Merci, merci beaucoup, uh, Grit, pour, uh, votre... Thank you very much, Grit, for your very interesting presentation on the UN Global Compact and the local networks. Unfortunately, we will not have time to have questions and answers due to time constraints. We have gone over time for this session, unfortunately, but I should now conclude. So first of all, I'd like to thank each and every one of our speakers for their valuable contributions. They have shown us that partnerships between different stakeholders can really help to include people with disabilities. And it's not only good for businesses, they can also strengthen their and build their confidence, but it also helps cooperation agencies and NGOs and other stakeholders who can help people with disabilities to gain access to work. This can help us create a more inclusive work market. It was a pleasure and an honour to moderate this session.
Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Handila. And of course, also thanks from my side for all the very interesting speakers, all the insights shares in this partnering sessions, as expected, very, very exciting session and uh, good to be partnering, uh, keep partnering and keep collaborating, which is also, of course, at the core of our uh, global business and disability network and at the core of the national business and disability networks, including in Africa. Now we move into the last session of today. Uh, before doing so, I would like to just take a few moments to launch the last and final poll on barriers. And those uh, who will be part of the last session, which is a multi-stakeholder discussion. So basically in that session, we will have representatives from the non-business actors that th can support business uh, on the employment of persons with disabilities and anything related to disability and accessibility um, can pick up on, on the results of this poll and I'll just read it out. So what in your view are the main barriers, um, actually it should say the main barrier <laughs> for the employment of persons with disabilities in the private for profit sector? You have one choice. Of course we know, I mean, otherwise we wouldn't have put it there. It's all barriers, but in your view, what is the main barrier and you see here it's stigma and prejudice faced by persons with disabilities as a potential uh, main barrier, the lack of financial and technical assistance to companies, physical and digital barriers in the workplace, or the difficulties to match job vacancies and candidates with disabilities. I'll give you a few more moments um, to uh, put in your choice. Give it another, I see good half of the participants by now participated in the poll. I'll give it a few more seconds, uh, just also to give people a chance to read it properly and um, take a decision. We know it's, uh, it's all barriers that uh, people with disabilities face when they try to enter and stay in employment, uh, private sector employment. So just closing it now. And you should see on your screen now that um, basically the first choice we provided, the stigma and prejudice faced by persons with disabilities was chosen by almost two thirds of those who responded to the poll, 62% followed then equally by physical and digital barriers in the workplace, the difficulties to match job vacancies and candidates with disabilities. And uh, lastly, the lack of financial and technical assistance to companies. So interesting, the stigma and prejudice by a vast majority of respondents is seen as a, as a main barrier. And well, it makes sense because if we would uh, be able to overcome this stigma and prejudice, that people with disabilities face. I think many of the other issues that uh, are barriers uh, for the employment of persons with disabilities would basically, um, well, not automatically, but I guess it would be much easier to address these barriers and dismantle um, these, these uh, structural problems we have. So, um, just this as, as, as an introduction in a way for this multi-stakeholder discussion that we're gonna start now, because it might be interesting for the, for the speakers we have in this discussion to also reflect on the answers we just saw. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, this uh, multi-stakeholder discussion is really a way to also bring in stakeholders in the labor market um, that are not businesses or employers, um, federations, um, but also have a role to play or can potentially play a role in promoting the employment of persons with disabilities in the open labor market. So we have with us today in this uh, last session, Biran Tiam. Uh, he's a permanent administrative secretary, council of labor and social dialogue at the West African Economic and Monetary Union. Then we have with us also Lefoko Kesamang, He's a senior social welfare officer as, at the African Union Commission. So representing the government here today. 
We have Caroline Kamati Mugala, the Executive Secretary of the East African Trade Union Confederation, so a regional grouping of trade union uh, trade unions, workers' organizations. And last but not least, we have Eric Ngondi. Uh, he's the director of the United Disabled Persons of Kenya, UDPK, also a member of the um, Kenya Business and Disability Network from the OPD side, from the side of organizations of persons with disabilities. So what, what I will do, I will um, ask a question to each of the persons I just mentioned, and each of them will have se around seven minutes uh, to respond that uh, to that question. Um, take that time, take a little bit more, take a little bit less <laughs> the way you feel that um, you, you, you need uh, time to respond to the question. And I would like to um, start with Mr. Tiam. Because within the work of the West African Economic and Monetary Union, you personally have tried to promote inclusion of persons with disabilities through social dialogue. Um, so social dialogue, the dialogue between employers, workers, and governments. Uh, where do you see opportunities in promoting disability inclusion in social dialogue? And where do you st still see challenges, also maybe looking at the results of the poll we just had. Mr. Tiam, over to you. Thank you. I'd like to start by thanking you for having been kind enough to associating uh, this the Council of Labor and Social Dialogue and transmit our warm greetings to the members. I'm going to talk, we're talking about a specific context. Uh, the YMU, I mean, the West African Economic and Monetary Union groups together a certain number of countries Côte d'Ivoire, Guinea-Bissau, Senegal, and Togo, whose mission or whose objectives are to strengthen the competitiveness of member states, to ensure the convergence of uh, and create a common market and harmonized it, uh, conditions for member states. WAMU has set up uh, its Council of Labor and Social Dialogue, mo made up of 72 members, nine members per country. It's a, a tripartite council. We have the governments, the employers and workers and members of civil society who have been grouped together within this assembly to examine and appreciate everything to do with social dialogue and strengthen consultation mechanisms, tripartite in particular, and to for capacity building and uh, supports social dialogue within member states. We, we've talked about various themes. The reflection we thought about, uh, that is persons with disabilities, has come from a certain number of uh, statements. We think they represent some 15, 1 billion people, 15% of the workforce. Many of them suffer from discrimination as when compared to persons without disabilities, they have a much higher uh, unemployment rate and insufficient social protection, particularly in the last two years characterized by the COVID-19 pandemic. So persons with disabilities are those who, people who suffer from health and have less access to a certain number of jobs. So on this issue, we, on the 15th of April, we, the 4th of April, we adopted legislation for persons with disabilities directly for both men and women adopted in 2019 to promotion the social dialogue in enterprises. And 
we've worked with the European Union on persons with disabilities in the world of work in member states of YMU. So the 20, this uh, legislation talks about the interest and translates the importance of, of including persons with disabilities, promoting legality between equality between men and women, but uh, and including persons living with disabilities. We, we encourage back to work policies and we base ourselves on the convention of the United Nations for persons with disabilities. We've incorporated this in YMU concerning We've asked the commission to guarantee the effectiveness of the convention on persons with disabilities. And the, the, through the, the United Nations General Assembly to set up policies and programs uh, linked to vocational training in enterprises in YMU members to favor, especially the promotion of young persons, women and men with disabilities in the member states of YMU facilitating their access to jobs. Uh, our commission was very receptive to this, and now we have vocational training under the de development department is going to, is going to create this, uh, this uh, and to it include persons with disabilities with a, a business plan so to take up the questions, we've asked member states to consolidate their the access of persons with disabilities to access to training, particularly to digital in digital um, jobs, and to take to encourage companies to incorporate persons with disabilities, particularly to to deconstruct the unfavorable uh, work possibilities for these persons, P PWDs, and to promote their vocational uh, insertion and their, their access to jobs. We've uh, encouraged them to take the necessary steps to encourage mo uh, the mobility of uh, elderly persons with disabilities and to respect the general principles of law and the, the labor code, the equality of opportunity for men and women, and taking account of the specific situation of persons with disabilities. We've asked for in the workplace to undertake actions to address specifically the problems of PWDs, to promote awareness in the enterprise to favor implementation of policies to favor access to jobs for PWDs and to encourage uh, more favorable policies for a better uh, uh, accounting of for these persons. And finally, as far as civil society is concerned, to, to promote studies and themes on the particular issue of disability and setting up expert networks and uh, to promote uh, access of persons with disabilities to jobs and particularly organizations of employers and workers organizations to strengthen the mechanism of advocacy for PWDs and uh, early warning system for, for stigma and discrimination against these persons and promote awareness and extending, disseminating knowledge as to the particular problem faced by PWDs. So more or less, ladies and gentlemen, this is the work that we've been doing and we still have before us to address the problem of access of jobs to uh, persons with disabilities. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And I'm certainly ready to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tiam. 
it's uh, it's it's very insightful for us also in the ILO to hear what's happening in in West Africa because I mean many of you might know that the ILO is a tripartite organization of the United Nations system and unlike other parts of the United Nations we are not only governed as ILO by our governments uh, governments of our member states so the ministries of labor usually or social protection but also by the most representative uh, employers federations and most representative uh, trade unions of each of our 187 member states um, and and what what is essential for the ILO is social dialogue bringing these main actors together and also have them now, for, of course, from a disability rights perspective, letting them talk and discuss about the inclusion of persons with disabilities. And seeing this happening in West Africa is very much uh, encouraging and something we as ILO also uh, need to promote in other uh, parts of the world. So thanks so very much, very insightful. Um, now, um, Moving to Lefoko Kesamang, um, he's a senior social welfare officer as a, at the African Union Commission. Mr. Um, Kesamang, as a representative of the of the intergovernmental organization that covers the whole continent that we're addressing today in the regional conference, how can the African Union, the African Union Commission, and the national governments, which are part of the union, promote the employment of persons with disabilities? Mr. Kesama, I, I fear the audio is not coming through properly. We have difficult. There's some. I think we can hear you now. Not the volume is not very high. The volume could be increased. That would be good. Okay. okay. Is yes. it better? Very good. Ah, Thank all you. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I've also shoot off the video. Yeah, no, I'm saying that I'm Lef Kokesama from the African Union Commission here in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And uh, I'm the focal person for disability, aging, social protection, and social policy, as well as the family in Africa. These are the programs that I'm, I'm driving. Of course, um, my main one that I started here a few years back is on disability. That's what I, I've been driving for many years. And I would like to mention that the African Union, the African Union has got a strategic framework um, uh, uh, which drives the African, the African Union Disability Program or the African Union, uh, Union Disability Vision and Mandate. And it's called the African Union Disability Architecture. And it is it has got uh, the policy, which is the African Union Disability Strategic Framework, which was uh, adopted in 2019. And it has got the legal instrument, which is the, um, uh, the, uh, the protocol to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights on the rights of persons with disabilities in Africa. And it also has got um, um, an institute, or uh, uh, it's called the African Union Disability Institute, which is um, a regional, should be a regional office when it is operationalized, which will be assisting and uh, guiding member states doing research, capacity building, and et cetera. Based on this, so the African Union has developed this in order to drive the disability inclusion and disability rights in Africa. And in relation to persons with disability uh, with regard to employment, um, this uh, policy instrument and the legal instrument uh, recognizes that without dealing with the social and physical environments, uh, employment is going to be a challenge for persons with disabilities in Africa. And also that uh, persons with disabilities are less likely to be in full employment and they face extra cost, of course, uh, in relation related to disability. And this reduces their economic resilience and uh, that uh, without elementary skills, the need for employment becomes a challenge, meaning that um, for us to talk about employment of and employment of persons with disability, we should admit that uh, the challenges or the, 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 the barrier uh, started way back uh, when the child couldn't access education from elementary education, preschool, 
and without the right education, the right skills and the right training, a person with disability will not be able to compete in this space uh, of person or, or in the space of, uh, of employment. And this is where the whole um, a, a discussion, the whole um, um, a, 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 the whole discussion about and debate about employment of persons with disabilities in Africa should start that they do not um, uh, um, significantly access education and inclusive education is still something that needs to be worked upon. And of course, it's, this is partnered by the attitude of employers, including the government and everyone else because, because of this, this stigma and this attitude and the discrimination of persons with disabilities in the continent. They, they, they are not, uh, they do, they, they are not um, um, uh, uh, considered candidates of employment or even investment or access to financial assistance uh, like, uh, like in, in everyone else. But because of this, member states are required and they, they have taken a decision by adopting uh, these policies to ensure that they change po uh, policies or they develop policies, they review existing policies. They also enact legislation or laws or act of parliament that would ensure that persons with disabilities have got access to employment. And also to, um, uh, to bring in the fact that uh, they are also required to, to take administrative and, and budgetary measures to ensure that the principle of equal pay for equal work is not used to undermine the right to work for persons with disabilities. And this, is, this, this are not just simple um, expectations or, or, or expectations or, or recommendations that were made and adopted because uh, they, they call upon I mean, governments to sit down and relook at the whole issue of persons with disabilities and employment and access to, uh, uh, to gainful employment. And I would like also to mention that access to financial services, which would assist persons with disabilities to create their own jobs and to be part of the creation of jobs is one of the challenges that of course you'll find. And this is what is required of member states. And an organization like the African Union and its organs like this organ where I am, to change their employment policies, recruitment policies, to ensure that persons with disabilities are, uh, are employed. Not only that, it would mean that even the physical space has to be changed, has to be uh, uh, to accommodate a uh, universal design as it is known, uh, to accommodate everyone. And lastly, let me just say that uh, um, uh, there, is, there is an opportunity. Uh, this platform provides that opportunity. And I would like to say to ILO, thank you so much for bringing up this. It's unfortunate that this morning I was involved with the regional office of WHO where we were talking about a, 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 a healthy aging. So I couldn't, uh, I mean, follow uh, the, the morning speakers as I would have loved to. But this provides an opportunity that the African Union Commission, of course, you, we partner with you in the area of labor, employment and my, migration. This can bring an opportunity that in the future we can organize because that's what we, we have that power and privilege a ministerial meeting that will specifically speak on this and feed on the main ministerial meeting of social development, labor and employment, where uh, as, uh, decisions can be taken uh, by during the summit uh, on, on, on the employment of persons with disabilities and the creation of jobs. And also that the private sector, your contribution is very, very vital just to as part of the, the, the closing that by employing persons with disability, government employing persons with disability, you are dealing with need, with hunger, with, uh, uh, um, uh, with everything that surrounds uh, the whole issue of excluding persons with disability. And in that sense, you are also contributing to the peace of this continent because conflict in Africa is uh, connected to poverty. It's connected to, to famine, it's connected to, to exclusion. You would be contributing to peace not only peace of the, in the continent, but peace at national level, not only peace at national level, but in the family as well. And you are also recognizing that persons with disabilities are, 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 are a resource that will contribute towards the development of Africa so that by 2063, we should be looking back and say, yes, the government 
and uh, the government and the private sector contributed to ensuring um, an Africa that is equal, an Africa that is inclusive, and an Africa that recognizes the rights of persons with disabilities. And this is what uh, all of us, of course, uh, I would like to implore and say that let us come together. And lastly, to say to those who are in the area of research, in the academia, to say that we need that collated um, a, 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 a data that is analyzed and disaggregated to show that uh, uh, how many persons with disabilities are employed and how many of them have got skills and how many of them don't have skills and what can be done. So all of us putting our hands together, Africa would be different than the Africa that we are talking about today. Thank you so much, Mr. Moderator. No, thank you very much, Mr. Kesamang, uh, especially also for reminding us about the higher level goals um, that that we can uh, that we can contribute to by promoting the inclusion of persons with disabilities in labor markets, in decent work, uh, issues of peace, uh, resilience, uh, equality, fairness. So thanks, thanks so much for that. Um, so it's uh, the work is never done. Uh, we can always do better. So thanks for for these reminders. Now moving on to um, Caroline Kamati Mugala. She's the Executive Secretary of the East African Trade Union Confederation. And Ms. Mugala, you represent the trade unions in East Africa. How can workers' organizations contribute to the employment of persons with disabilities um, as well as their career development um, once they are in the labor market? Because we know it's, it's hard enough <laughs> to get into decent work, so to say. Um, but also what can we do once persons with disabilities are employed and uh, want, as everybody else, um, um, get their career progress and uh, improve? Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Yon. Um, <clears throat> I think, first of all, um, we need to look at the enabling environment for, for workers with disability to be able to access employment and also to thrive once they they access employment and and it's it's very important uh, for us to know that uh, the workers group within the ILO has played a major role in terms of ensuring uh, we have policies in place that provide for enabling environment and and I'm particularly talking about convention 159 on vocational rehabilitation and employment and also the recommendation 168 though it's very sad out of the 84 ratification i think only about 10 or less than 10 uh, are for are from africa so i think it's also it's, it's it's very important for us to ensure that we participate in the process in the processes of putting together the legal uh, framework to ensure that rights of people with disability in the world of work are actually uh, protected. Uh, but how can we contribute to the employment and, and career growth as, <clears throat> as, as, um, um, as trade unions? And, and, and I'm not shocked, uh, Yon, from, from, uh, from, from the voting that just happened before our session, uh, stigmatization came uh, top in the challenges uh, in terms of uh, the challenges that uh, workers with disability are faced. Uh, coming from Africa, uh, this is the beginning of the marginalization of people with disability. And, and this is right um, uh, from, from, from uh, the society, the education system, access to medical care, and, 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 and up to up to you know economic empowerment of people with disability. So what have the trade unions uh, been doing? I think one of them, uh, one of the area that we've worked on is the issue around skills and technical capacity, and this still goes back to the to the voting, um, uh, the stigma that comes with having a child with disability. Um, uh, therefore, most of them are not entering the labor market. Uh, they're entering actually the labor market with little or no skills from the formal uh, education. So trade unions have been shaping the vocational training 
uh, which is key in providing you know skills and technical expertise needed for people uh, with disability and they are already in the world of work uh, and also this is also very important in terms of those ones who acquire disability later in, in, in work or in you know in the line of duty in terms of reskilling and retraining uh, those particular workers and, and most trade unions are actually represented in the TVEC boards and issues of certification particularly in the informal economy because we need to also um, uh, understand where are the majority of workers with disability um, uh, found or located within uh, the labor, the world of, uh, of world. Most of them are actually represented within the informal economy. So they are facing, you know, m even more challenges because they are not, uh, they are not in the formal economy. So the TVET in, in, in several uh, uh, countries <clears throat> have been, you know, offering some kind of uh, you know certification of people within the informal economy if you are a mechanic if you are you know you work in a salon uh, if 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 you are a tailor and uh, some kind of testing that you are taken through and you're given certification to show that you are you are certified and with this certificate you can use to access employment within the formal um, uh, the formal sector the second one then comes down to issue around uh, labor, re uh, labor law reviews. Uh, there has been quite a number of uh, reviews of labor laws uh, across the continent, and it's, uh, you are seeing more and more issues of uh, workers with disability uh, coming out clearly within uh, the review of labor laws. And as, as already mentioned, this is normally a tripartite process that happens in terms of um, ensuring um, that um, the rights of workers with disability are actually taken uh, care of. Uh, some have gone further to include, you know, workers with disability as a constitutional matter. And, uh, you know, one of the best cases has been where we have quota system build, you know, on opportunities for people with disability, whether in the trade union, in government and down to industry, and I, I can pick Kenya's constitution. But however, implementation is, 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 is another major challenge. Uh, and, and another um, a case, you know, best case uh, from, from the trade union in terms of, um, uh, uh, protecting workers with disability and also making you know uh, the environment in terms of where they work uh, better in, so which means you know having that uh, space for them to to thrive as workers has been a uh, committee of people committees of people with disability within the trade union structure why is this important i, I think uh, you know, they normally say nothing for us without us. You know, the workers with disability understand better the challenges that they go through. So in terms of uh, uh, being part and parcel of decision making within the trade union in terms of uh, contribution to policy discussions that are, that are happening, it's, it's normally takes a different approach when you have people with disability within the decision-making structures of, 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 of the union. Just the same way we have the youth and the women committees, uh, we, we are seeing quite a number of trade unions, uh, you know, constituting a committee of people with disability within, within, their, uh, within their structures. And where you have the vibrant uh, union with uh, <coughs> Sorry. And where you have unions with vibrant committee of workers with disability, then this is also reflected in the activities and policies uh, uh, of, in, in terms of their advocacy work, in terms of uh, decent work. The fourth, the fourth area we we'll talk about is, uh, <clears throat> and it's already been mentioned by my previous colleagues, is the, the issue, issue around, around strengthening, strengthening social, social dialogue. dialogue that includes workers with disability. 
you know, as trade unions, we negotiate for rights of our members through collective bargaining agreements. And, and within the collective agreements, and then you ensure also, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the rights that are very, very specific to workers with disability. And th this also uh, leans on my previous uh, comment in terms of unions with vibrant uh, disability committee. This is also reflected in their process of, you know, uh, CBA negotiation, um, which not only includes, uh, you know, uh, people, uh, workers with disability, but also rehabilitation of those workers who might get disabled while still in service or um, with in, in line of duty in their CBAs. I think my colleague from West Africa, countries like Togo, Benin, have some brilliant uh, uh, examples around social dialogue and, and, and opportunities that it has offered for workers with disability in Uganda. I just joined the, the, the webinar when, um, when someone from Uganda was sharing the, the amazing job that they are doing uh, there. Um, and, and then last but not least is the issue around workplace occupational safety uh, and health committees. And, and, and this is really important and we really need to, you know, um, look further in terms of what this, you know, workplace committees actually do uh, with respect to COVID-19 and the challenges that, uh, that came in. Um, because of a workplace occupation or uh, safety and health, where some of uh, uh, the, the workers with disability probably were not able to use or were not able to work from home, you know, work remotely because of, you know, the kind of disability they have. And, and I'm really uh, proud of the ILO. This webinar, we have, you know, the sign language interpreters. So you can imagine you're working with your colleagues, but there's no sign language interpreter and you're supposed to work, you know, or virtually. So I think it, it, it also it needs also us needs to, widen to widen the scope around scope. issues of occupational safety and health of, of our workers at, um, at, at, at workplace. Uh, but this is also not just... Uh, uh, you know, ensuring safety at workplace, but it, it has also worked uh, both as a preventive measure in terms of ensuring we don't fall into disability. And, and, and I conclude by, you know, one of, you know, my favorite quote from, you know, I picked from somewhere where they say, everyone has a, is a potential person with disability. So, so as we uh, have discussed, as we make, you know, uh, the enabling environment for workers with disability to thrive and their rights to be protected, let us also remember that we are actually a candidate to disability. So let's make that environment better as we think about us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Mugala. I think uh, important reminder also about the quality of employment issues like occupational safety and health you mentioned, right? Because uh, oftentimes we, we, we are a bit, well, let's say obsessed with, with uh, getting jobs uh, also for people with disabilities, but then looking at the quality of jobs. Not, uh, not all jobs are decent jobs. So that's, I think it's also one of the uh, uh, points that at least uh, stuck out um, for me. So, so thanks so much, Ms. Mugala. Now, um, and uh, you also said uh, nothing about us without us, right? The, the motto of the disability rights movement. So I'm very happy now to introduce um, Eric Ngondi, director at the UDPK, United Disabled Persons of Kenya. Um, we see you upside down. I'm not sure if that's... Um, uh, Mr. Ngondi, um, on my screen, you're upside down, but anyways, we can work that way too. Um, so the UDPK is one of the vice chairs of the National Business and Disability Network in Kenya. Um, which role do you see for organizations of persons with disabilities to engage companies on employment issues and which challenges remain in this area? Thank you.
thank you. Yeah, uh, Eric here, um, African male, uh, visually impaired in dark glasses, in a red shirt and a black trouser. And so um, on to the question, uh, the Kenya Business and Disability Network in uh, Kenya is the National Business and Disability Network, uh, comprising of 70% company and 30% organizations of and for persons with disabilities. The United Disabled Persons of Kenya, UDPK, is the national umbrella body of, of, of organizations of persons with disabilities. And also, and also uh, one of the vice chairs of KBDN. We bring the constant voice of persons with disabilities in the network. Strictly speaking, KBDN is an employer-led initiative championing issues of rights of persons with disabilities and inclusivity within uh, uh, employment space. So uh, regarding in the last uh, four, uh, year, four years or so, we've seen, we recognize the important, the pivotal role of, of organizations of persons with disabilities within the labor market as capacity builders of employers disability confident. There have been a shift in the respect, recognition and, and empowerment of, of, of organizations of persons with disabilities by international development organizations such as Site Savers, um, International Disability Alliance, and others. And uh, interestingly, for, for organizations of persons with disability, there has, has been, been a shift, shift. Comfort, on on in the, uh, comfort zone of rights-based advocacy. And, and uh, we have, we have learned that uh, advocacy, advocacy is very, very imperative. And more to that is the collaborative relationship with companies that are willing to be more inclusive, but just don't know how. And this is where organizations of persons with disability have and must plug in. Uh, Eric, simply put, this is the interpreter speaking. Your sound keeps dropping in and out. I'm not sure if there's any way to make the audio more consistent so I can do a better job understanding what you're saying so I can interpret it. Okay. Um, I, I've uh, switched off uh, the video. Maybe that would be better. Let's give it you a can try. Hear me? Okay. Um, so I was saying um, the, the, the pivotal role of, of organizations of persons with disabilities within the labor market as uh, capacity builders of employers disability confident. And as I said, there has been a shift in the recognition respect and empowerment of, of organizations of persons, of persons with disabilities. International development agent organizations such as the Site Savers, International Disability Alliance and others. And uh, interestingly, organizations of persons with disabilities have had to move uh, or shift from their comfort zone to, 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 to to basically um, uh, capa as capacity builders now. And we've learned that capacity building is very imperative. However, we need to build a collaborative relationship with, with companies that are willing to be more inclusive. However, just, they just don't know how. And this is where of organizations of persons with disability can continue plugging in and simply because meaningful participation of organizations of persons with disability delivers impact. Impact. And uh, in KBDN, 
persons with disabilities are represented by United Disabled Persons of Kenya and working together with companies, we realize uh, of the value, the value, the valuable uh, solutions they provide to the problem of the missing middle, uh, referring to the gap of lack of uh, disability confidence due to lack of capacity building within the labor market functions. And so what we have seen is that when we carry out disability training, uh, when we carry out unconscious bias training to organizations, and even when we are doing uh, uh, disability uh, audits, we see uh, the staff, the employees who are curious, who are engaged, inquisitive, and really uh, pointing out the solutions to barriers uh, for persons with or, or, or for persons with, with disabilities within their environment. And despite the, the, the challenges in that space, they're able to tell us, you know, this could be the possible solutions to persons uh, with disabilities. And so uh, what then can we uh, add? And uh, I, I think we, we have been on a, on, a, on a massive journey. We are on a massive journey, but uh, it seems a, a, like it, it will take forever. However, we must not give up. We must be flexible. We must be resilient and we must adapt and change. We must... Uh, support organizations of persons with disabilities through funding and financing so that they can continue bringing in the change, working collaboratively with uh, companies. And we must support companies that are leading in inclusion so that they can drag along laggards who do not see the imperative, uh, the imperativeness of inclusion for their own long-term business uh, sustainability. And that's why uh, we must upscale uh, relationships, important, important relationships with organizations such as Unilever, Coca-Cola, and even the regional and national organizations such as Safari Corp, uh, Bamburi, Unga, yeah. and yeah. many other. And, uh, transform the way we carry out uh, inclusive employment. So not to box persons with disabilities within, uh, with, within what they can or they cannot do, but to look at the needs uh, and the requirement and remove barriers and provide accessibility so that they can uh, continue, uh, they can uh, perform on an equal basis with others. And organizations or companies that uh, are carrying out uh, disability inclusive uh, development through programs, projects, uh, and other activities must involve collaboratively organizations of persons with disabilities, uh, especially those from underrepresented groups such as uh, neurodiverse, psychosocial and uh, others. And uh, also, we, we look forward to continue working with companies on issues of uh, disability data. And uh, Kesamang mentioned this uh, very well. And just to conclude, just to say that uh, the pandemic has shown us, has shown us that uh, um, labor markets and uh, working uh, space and companies can actually be flexible, can actually change, can be resilient, they can adapt and uh, to, to many barriers that they've faced. And this is the opportunity that companies can take to bring on persons with disabilities, with the skills and experience, and so that they are part of, uh, of this journey. And, and I want to thank you and leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ngondi. Uh, first of all, for accepting our invitation to speak today, and of course, for the very insightful and important remarks. Because I think uh, whenever we 
we really must follow the motto, nothing about us without us, uh, when it comes to the employment of persons with disabilities equally. Um, so thanks for that. And um, I, I see that uh, our time for this session is already um, um, running out, or we're running out of time really, uh, but I just want to each of the speakers in this, um, in this discussion, I just want to give you one more opportunity to just summarize in, in, a, in a single sentence <laughs> um, your key message to, to the audience here today or in general, and I will just go um, from, from back to front again, uh, not again, but really from the, from the last speaker to the first speaker. So Mr. Ngondi, I would ask you for just one final remark, uh, ideally summarized in, in, in one sentence, and then I would ask the other speakers to do the same. Thank you, Georgian. And uh, uh, in one sentence, I think what I can just say is that uh, um, basically those words that there's nothing for us without us, persons with disabilities must and should be past part of uh, uh, this journey. Uh, and so all the activities, all the programs, all the initiative should and must include uh, persons with disabilities. Uh, remembering the issues of data, and the opportunity of financing and funding. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mugala, one, one last sentence from your side. Uh, I think I will just pick something I've seen in the chat, uh, issues of, 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 of workers with disability, uh, you know, have structural uh, 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 issues in terms of challenges. So, it's not just uh, employment is one of them, but uh, there needs to be, you know, a multifaceted approach to dealing with issues of disability in order uh, to bring out, you know, the best of workers with disability, whether it's access to education, access to health, access to, uh, to, to workplace. I think we need to have it, uh, we, we need to mainstream it. Just the way we've done with gender and youth, we need to have the same, same discussions with issues around workers with disabilities. Thank you. Yon. Thank you, thank you. Mr. Kesamang, um, one, your, your key message summarized in one single sentence. Um, just, just to say that um, inclusion is a must. And is if we want to experience the Africa we want, we have to ensure that persons with disabilities have got access to employment and have got access to creating employment for everyone else. That is what I just want to live with. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Mr. Tiam, one, one sentence that would summarize your key messages, please. Mr. Tiam, I'm not sure if you have technical issues or, yeah, I see now, okay. Thank you. I don't see any questions that affect me, but I would say that we're open to all types of collaboration to strengthen and improve the working conditions of PWDs. We are very willing to collaborate with anyone who wishes to. And I would like to reiterate my thanks simply and my satisfaction for having been involved in this exercise, which we feel is very important. And I would like to Thank to Mr. Jung and Menz for involving us and helping us in the preparation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tiam. So with this, uh, I would close this session and would directly move into the closing remarks, uh, which have been assigned to myself. So um, I just wanna, of course, uh, thank everybody who moderated today, who spoke today, 
um, who interpreted today, who helped organizing this. Thanks so much for that. I think we got many positive comments here in the chat uh, through other channels like email, LinkedIn, uh, MS Teams. So I think, uh, I hope it was really relevant for those who are still in the call and who had joined us earlier. Um, we will of course make the recording available of this conference as I had also put in the chat several times. We will ask um, those who have used slides to send them to us in case they haven't done so yet. So we will send out the recording with the slides so you have all the information in one package. Of course, I want to encourage you to keep collaborating, engaging with each other uh, in your respective country, in Africa or even interregionally, globally. Um, we are here as ILO, Global Business and Disability Network, to convene, to connect. If you realize, oh, there was somebody in the chat that, you know, I would like to um, uh, talk to more and you don't have the contact details, also ask us. We can ask the person if he, she is fine with having the contact details shared. But we are very much a convener and connector. So uh, I hope um, that this conference today helped connecting and being inspired by the good practices that we heard about uh, from companies, from NGOs, uh, from other stakeholders in the labor market when it comes to the inclusion of persons with disabilities. Um, I would also encourage you, if you don't do that already, um, to follow the uh, LinkedIn space of the ILO Global Business and Disability Network, where we usually share um, some of the latest events that we organize or that we are aware of, or some of the articles, some of the practices of, of companies. So that is um, an option to follow us. Probably when you registered for this conference, you were asked whether you want to be included in our newsletter. And I hope many of you will have said yes. If you don't remember, uh, you can also uh, go to our website, businessanddisability.org and register for our newsletter, which comes out every two months. Uh, one of the uh, next events we will have is a global annual conference of the Global Business and Disability Network. This obviously was a regional conference uh, targeting uh, Africa, the, the global conference will happen on the 28th of November. I'm just putting it, this here in the, in the chats uh, with a registration link. So hopefully many of you will be able to join the global annual conference, which obviously has a bit of a different format, but also has many company practices uh, on different technical issues, uh, procurement, on neurodiversity. I think somebody just mentioned neurodiversity on, on um, on um, partnering as well. So feel free if you can to join that conference. As always, it's it's free of charge. Unfortunately, there we will not have uh, interpretation into French. So that conference will be entirely in English, but hopefully that will not create too many barriers to for too many uh, people to attend. Again, thanks so much. Also, especially to um, Handy Lavarela, who we have seen several times today, but she was uh, our main consultant for this work of the workshop we had three weeks ago and the conference today. She really did the heavy lifting. So thanks so much, Handila, for all the hard work you have done and uh, gone out of your way to make this happen today. And um, so very much grateful for that. Also my direct colleague, Arya Tung, who has been helping with the conference and all the work related uh, to the conference and the workshop and many, many more that I should name by, uh, name by their names, but I think then we would have to add another hour. But again, thanks so much to all the speakers, to the moderators, and of course, all of you who took um, so many hours out of your busy day to be with us today. That is really much appreciated. And um, we will be in touch. Thanks so much for joining us today. And we hope to see you soon. If it's virtual, that's great. And even better if at some point we meet in person again or for the first time. So thanks so much. And uh, we'll be in touch with more events and news from the ILO Global Business and Disability Network, I'm sure. Take care. Have a good evening and um, see you soon.